important. And moving on here as we are just getting uh, closer to showtime. The lovely Jenny White Bear. Lovely Lauren. How you doing? Go 66. Boo to you. And I mean that in a positive way. Ian Burwell, thanks for coming on in. The gorgeous Tammy Finnegan, nice to have you back. Sweet Donnie D, what's happening? Molotov, it's been a while. Nice to have you back here. Uh, Glenn John McEnroe, the pride of Wimbledon. Double Tim, nice to have you here. And uh, Sir Brian Bowden, there he is. 18,486 podcasts. All broadcasting simultaneously. Stu Gerson. Right there. Hey, Batmon, thank you so much for that awesome super chat. Really do appreciate that. Super chat is a great way to support what we do here on a nightly basis, and it really supports what we do. Thank you so much. Chuck Elliott, good to see you. I'm going to miss a few here because we got to get going. Let's get ready to get your horns up. Steve Stockton, KPNL. Here we go, everyone. From the mountains of central British Columbia, to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. The man known as the Crypto Guru is back. One of my favorite friends and authors, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. He is known as the guru around here because literally he is the guru when it comes to everything cryptid, paranormal, supernatural, and he writes about it, and this is why he is an award-winning author. A scholarly man, he takes his words very delicately and literally romanticizes the monsters that scare us at night. And we are so proud to have him here telling us some fabled stories as we get into lake monsters, sea monsters, and any monster that our audience wants to hear of later on in the show. The Guru, always a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio, my friend. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm awesome, man. You're far too kind, as a matter of fact. Uh, every time I'm on here, you give me a glowing review, and you have my head swollen for about a week and a half. But uh, there's truly no place I'd rather be at uh, 12 a.m. my time until 3 o'clock my time than with you and your Spaced Out listener, Russ, listeners. Spaced Out radio listeners, I, ca- I cannot wait. Well, you know what? We're, I want people to get to know you a little bit because you are an educated man. You, I believe you have your, your master's in, is it history? I do, I do, yeah. And I actually um, just, uh, uh, well, it was, been t- it was two years in August. Um, I got my uh, 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 master's uh, in uh, counseling from Temple University. So uh, I, I've been doing a lot. I, I, I work with uh, families for most of my adult life, uh, working with uh, at-need and at-risk children, and I've been working as an elder advocate uh, for a number of years as well. Um, so a lot of the things that people would know about me is that I, I, I deal a lot with uh, childhood education, and not only with the uh, education of children, um, but also in the realms of making sure that these children are taken care of. So I work with families who are at risk for whatever reasons, whether it's poverty or whether it's um, some sort of substance abuse, uh, trying to get them on the right track and just trying to be the voice for a lot of people that have been silenced for too long. 
That's awesome, buddy. That is completely awesome yeah. that you take the time to do that. Because I know as a single father of five, your day mm-hmm. is already busy. Where do you find time to write between all uh-huh. of this? You know, I, I think about that as well, too. Um, I always have a little notebook with me. So even if I can't, you know, whip out the uh, computer, I have my little notebook to, to, to jot down um, ideas. Uh, so, I mean, it, it is difficult, um, but I think there's a passion there. You have to have a passion. If you don't, then none of this stuff will come to fruition. Um, so, I mean, I have a passion for helping people, and I also have a passion for writing and I think that whenever you have those kind of diversities in your life, you'll you'll make time to make sure that uh, both of them get addressed. Now, the one problem that I have in working my, my, my real job is there's a lot of toxicity in there. You know, you have things like called hereditary toxicity that is very contagious. So there are times whenever I have to take a time out and I have to just sit back and say, okay, I can't do this right now. And that happens a good bit. You know, you have to take some personal time for healing. Um, but really one of the ways that I heal and I, that I kind of work uh, at my own um, uh, self-awareness is through my writing. So it's kind of a, uh, a, therapy, a therapy for me. Everybody needs an escape. You use monsters as an okay. escape. Why did you choose monsters to write about? Yeah. And not just well, not just fabled stories, yeah. but you're going after real monsters that people are having alleged encounters with. Right, right. Well, I think that that is that that's something that's been instilled with me since I've been a kid with my mom. Uh, my mom would, you know, sh- she was a fanatic whenever it came to stories of Bigfoot and the Loch Ness monster and UFOs, and she really was there in my formative years. Uh, not only, uh, you know, to, to show me about the books and read these books to me, uh, but also, you know, let me see all these great movies like The Legend of Boggy Creek whenever I was just a kid. And this really kind of um, uh, formulized uh, who I was going to be. So what I, I did, and, and, you know, everybody has this natural fear of the dark. And what I do, I mean, even to this day, I still sleep with a nightlight on. But what I, I try to do is shed a little bit of light into those shadows. Find out what's over there because it, it, what what haunts me and what terrifies me is the same thing that haunts you and terrifies you. And whenever you connect all the dots, it seems as if these are the same things that haunt us throughout the ages and across the world, uh, regardless of uh, you know creed or color or whatever. Um, so it's part of our human identity, these monsters are. And I've said before, that they are actually embroidered into our DNA. Um, these creatures uh, need us as much as we need them. And whenever I say that we need them, is they put us in our place. They remind us that we have not conquered every single mystery in life. Uh, they remind us of our own, own mortality. And they also remind us, they're also a warning of what we can be if we continue to go down the road that we are on. Um, a lot of these creatures like vampires and werewolves, um, at the end of the day, uh, it is almost like a Scooby-Doo cartoon, and you take off the werewolf mask or the vampire mask, and lo and behold, there is a regular human being underneath there. Uh, we project a lot of ourselves onto these so-called monsters. They take the place of what we don't want to admit that human beings are capable of doing. Um, we are a very heinous species that can do incredibly bad things as well as doing incredibly noble and worthwhile things. So these kind of monsters encapsulate the good in us and the bad in us. And that is really the kind of way I approach the paranormal. And a lot of people don't do it that way. Um, I look at the archetype. I look to see how these monsters have evolved uh, over the, the millennia and what they mean to us this very day. And whenever I do my research, I try to go back as far into the historical record as I can, uh, look at archaeological evidence and hints and conjectures uh, that are out there regarding these creatures that are have all been lost in the sands of time. Normally I don't take questions for hour number two, but you brought up the fact that you still sleep with a nightlight. Sure. So Sky Sites over on Twitch, tuning us in, and thank you, Sky Sites, for joining us tonight, says, I got a question. Where do you think the idea of closing your eyes for safety from certain creatures comes from? You know, that's actually a very, very good idea, uh, a very good notion. So 
It's probably very ancient. Um, I do know for a fact, and I, I, I will give you a precedent on this, um, it was believed in the Middle Ages uh, and in the Renaissance particularly uh, that um, magic was something that happened internally on the person. And we projected into the world this particular magic. And a lot of people saw as this projection as through the eyes. The eyes are the gateway to the soul. And by closing our eyes, we do not allow what is inside of us to appear or materialize within our own world. I think that's where a lot of it comes from. But I think whenever we look at this from a, a purely biological level, is that we're taking control of the situation. Uh, we are we are not admitting that something is out there. Um, it's the same way whenever you know you were a kid and you thought that there was something in your closet, so you pulled the covers up over your head. Um, I, I think that we as a a, a, a species have collectively pulled the cover up over our head. And I believe that in order to get to this this truth out there, we need to uh, take a peek over the covers every uh, once in a while. Uh, we have to take a peek in the closet, and we have to become friends with that monster that lives under our bed. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is here with us tonight on Spaced Out Radio. You know, I haven't slept with a nightlight for a long time, but man, there are times when I've woken up out of bed, man, and I swear there's monsters around. When you get that feeling, and many of us do, we we chalk it up to nightmares, we chalk Mm -hmm. it up to imagination. How many times are those monsters really there, my friend? Well, see, I, these are all very interesting questions, and I'm glad that we're getting right to the uh, the, the the heart of the matter. You know, uh, very early in, but but that that is really what I'm getting at, Dave. So we have this instinct within us to feel that there's something out there that is beyond our control. So it's that ancient flight or fight response that we have latent in all of us. You know, it, it originates the time that we were still in the savannah and we were not the apex predator. And there were, you know, we were prey to other creatures. And it's kind of that tingling sensation that you know that there's something out there and it's for self-preservation. Um, something is triggering that. Um, what that something is, I do not know. Um, I've never encountered a monster, uh, even though that I have had this, you know, these, these experiences, these feelings. But something biologically in me is telling me that there is danger out there. Now, is this something that's vestigial and, you know, it's, 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 it's rather atrophied and every now and then kicks on for no apparent reason? I don't think so. I think that there is something out in that environment that, that, you know, that we call life that, you know, is, is unexplained, Un, uncontrollable and possibly even unknowable that we can sometimes tap into and we know that it's not in our best interest to go any further. Okay. So if, if we know it's in our best interest not to go any further, mm. how do we, how do we define, you know, as we try to, de, to, to draw that line of sanity to insanity, if I could use right. those terms, what is real and what is imagination? Right. You know, because I I can tell you, you know, point blank, I have had experiences where I have woken up in the middle of the night and I've been so afraid that if I look down the hall, that there's an alien going to be an alien over there, that that I I literally throw the covers over my head. You know, I've had that experience. I have had other experiences, you know, where I'm lying in bed and all of a sudden I felt my leg get picked up. Yes. And I said, can you, I said, not tonight. Can you please put my leg down? And my leg goes back down, freaked me right out. Yeah. Okay. I've had that. So, and a lot of other people have had other same type of similar occurrences. So, how do we know what is real, true, and what is just, you know, fallacy? Right. Well, I, I, how how do we know that those experiences aren't genuine? You know, how do we know that what we are thinking in our mind isn't actually the fact that's going on? Um, you know, people used to say about you know night terrors and all this other stuff. Um, that, you know, it's caused by this sleep paralysis. Um, but, but how do we know that the essence of all this stuff, the essence of the succubus and the incubus, still is, isn't with us today, and we simply write them off because it's so, so archaic that we have to prescribe, you know, ascribe to it a, a, a new name now. Um, I'm really not of the opinion that all of our experiences are made up or psychological or in the mind. 
Um, how do we know that there's not an alien down down the, the hallway? Or how do we know that something has not seeped into our world while we're laying in bed? See, these are all questions that I keep on coming up with. And whenever I keep the light, night light on, that's a little bit of that demarcation between my world and their world that I'm hoping that there's an unspoken trust there that they will not infringe upon. But absolutely, my friend, look, these stories have been going on since the very beginning of history. One of the first things that has ever been written down, uh, you know, as part of the human being is talking about, you know, wild man encounters in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, so there is definitely something out there that has been haunting us and not just individuals, but haunting us as a human race. And, and we, you know, we've called them monsters, but, but I think there is something much more, um, elemental to it than just being monsters. I think it's something that we are aware of um, instinctually, but we have not put a name on it yet. Um, so I have no reason to doubt that if a person says they have this feeling that there's something in that room with them, that it could be actually something more than just a feeling. Well, let me ask you, because we have a... a hidden obsession each and every one of us mm. of the love of getting scared mm. we watch horror movies suspense movies you know everything from nightmare on elm street to insidious to blair witch project and paranormal activity mm. Mm. and we love being scared we love having that feeling of fright does that play a role into these monsters that we want to see and our imagination creating them for us, or is there a lot more reality to it? Um, well, from a biological point of view, uh, the same area of our brain that elicits fear is the same part of our brain that gives us um, joy and you know and happiness. So it's almost like that entertainment section of our brain. Um, for instance, like a lot of people, whenever they go on roller coasters. Uh, they'll laugh or if they go into a haunted house and something jumps out of them, they'll have that nervous laughter. That's because it comes from the same place. Um, I think, uh, see, these are all very difficult questions. <laughs> I think, I think that when we, we, we start dissecting them, they become even more complicated. Um, the, uh, because our world is so crazy, it seems as if monsters have become our entertainment. Um, if we think about, about a few years ago, whenever the world started to go a little bit haywire and zombies became the big thing, right? Um, and zombies are really another version of us. You know, they are the monster without the mask and their origin story is the same origin stories of, 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 our, of, of us. So these kind of creatures show us what happens in a world that is upside down and it's confusing. Um, the same way with this idea of these uh, UFOs and these UFO reports coming out. Um, one of the reasons why these things are being slowly leaked out, I think, is to uh, not only to appease people's curiosity, uh, but also a little bit to show that we really don't know what's going on out there. Um, so... Again, Dave, this is a very difficult situation, a very difficult question. But culturally, we need these monsters to represent something that we're lacking or something that we are afraid of. And um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I write about this stuff, because these same monsters have existed throughout the ages. Um, they're just interpreted differently by different cultures at different times. So if I li listen to what you're saying... Are you saying that we are more creating our own tulpas? In many cases, I think, especially, I, I, I've been investigating hauntings for a while. And um, about about 95% of the hauntings uh, that I investigate, and you probably know this from experience as well, too, um, they're not terrifying. Um, usually, whenever somebody encounters um, a force that they consider a ghost. It's usually something that's very reassuring. There's usually um, uh, a little instance of fear there because it's something out of the usual, but it's never something to be terrified about. 
Now, you have that 5% whenever people talk about demons and such. I believe that those, you know, rare 5% of hauntings are creations from our own mind that are unleashed into this world. And I think that tulpas do exist. I mean, this is actually coming from Eastern philosophy. Um, in many cultures, uh, things such as the Yeti are believed to be tulpas because so many people believe in that kind of creature that straddles the world between uh, the mundane and the uh, supernatural or the metaphysical. Um, so I think that we can indeed project from ourselves these types of creatures onto the world around us. Um, but a tulpa is far different than an archetype. And what my main interest is the idea of the archetype is something that is relatively unchanging and relatively rigid in the way that they have been betrayed over the years. Like, you know, like, like werewolves and wild men. And if we get into the idea of sea monsters and lake monsters later, um, these creatures very, very rarely change. Um, one creature that we can really look at uh, and discuss about how an evolution happens is with a chupacabra. You know, um, this is kind of like the new kid on the block. And originally it was um, identified and described as something that looked like almost like a, um, uh, a satanic porcupine. You know, it had this long flickering tongue and these big red eyes, and it was covered in these kind of sharp spines. And now it has evolved into this blue dog that runs amok in Texas. You know, so we see that the evolutions do happen here and, and, and our culture will define what kind of monster they want to have. So I think a chupacabra in and of itself could never be identified as an archetype, uh, possibly what it stands for could, but not an archetype in and of itself. And that's the reason why I look at things like witches and the things like vampires and, and lake monsters and such, because very rarely do they change year to year or uh, a subsequent generation to generation. We got two and a half minutes before we got to go to break at the bottom of the hour. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is with us. And, Ron, right before that, we go to the break where we're going to switch over to sea monsters, for you, how much fun is it researching all of these childhood monsters? Oh, man. I'll tell you what. Whenever I first started it, and I did it as a form of catharsis. You know, that's the reason why I go into the woods and why I do the things that I do is because as as a kid, I was naturally attracted to Bigfoot, but I was, at, you know, naturally repulsed by something like that as well, too, and very fearful of such a thing that lived out in the woods. So one of the reasons why I go out there is to find proof of what kind of things are out there. Um, and it's it's awesome. I mean, it, this is the best job in the world of research. I never see it as work. I see it as almost, uh, you know, um, uh, almost like a fun endeavor for me to go and research for hours on end about these creatures that I've I've had such a close relationship with. No, very true, very true. For you, as you have battled to to gain your ground in the popularity level of this field, how what has been your your biggest success so far? Um, I, I think finding my little niche there and, and, and coming at the world of the paranormal in the way that I do. Um, you know, I'm not sitting here saying that I'm an expert on all this kind of stuff. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, I've, I've um, encountered any of these creatures. I'm saying that these are all question marks out there. So I approach the world of the paranormal the same way your listeners do, with a lot of questions and with a lot of um a, a, a lot of research to do to try to get to the bottom of this. And I'm also very um, content on never getting to the bottom of this. This might be something that always is a mystery. And in a way, I'm kind of happy if it is always a mystery because we shouldn't, as a human being, know everything that's out there. There should always be these hidden places that keep us honest. Oh, very true. Very mm. true. In a field where there's a lot of dishonesty, trying to be honest is one of the Hardest parts of what we do on a that's daily right. basis because you're always fighting it. That's right. And I think that that's the thing. And that's a good point that you made there. And I think that that was very um, eloquently said as well. Like, how do you find your 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 niche in, in this field? Because there's so many people occupying almost every angle. I think the way to do it is you 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 maintain your honesty. Uh, you maintain your integrity. Um, you don't go off the deep end. And uh, you definitely don't go around pretending that you know everything, and you also don't go around uh, gallivanting that you know you're there to summon demons and things like that, like a lot of ghost hunters are doing. The crypto guru Ronald Murphy. When we come back, Guru is going to give us some time 
on sea monsters, lake monsters, everything from the Kraken and Chupacabra to the lizard-like beings swimming in our lakes of North America. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. That was a fast half hour. That was very fast. <clears throat> Looking good, Guru. I appreciate that, man. And a lot of people are still staying on. Nobody said, all oh, this show sucks and jumped off, right? Not yet. Not yet. Excellent. Not yet. Wow, we hit that hard the first half hour. That was some we pretty did. deep stuff there. We did. That's okay, though. We can take yeah. that. Yeah, we can take that. These listeners can take that. Mm-hmm. Hey, the, the Dirt Road Mystics said fantastic show. And see, I like that kind of feedback. Um, normally, whenever I do any kind of shows, you don't get that kind of immediate feedback. And I do like to see that. Hello, gorgeous Jennifer Hawkins. The stunning Katie is back. How are you? The lovely Helena. Uh, okay, Jeremy Jones. Uh, Ronald looks like he's going to take us on a safari. We are a safari of the mind. Mm-hmm. People love their guru, man. You can't make this shit up. People love their guru. Yancy, how you doing, buddy? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like Bat Moms. She throws in a super chat earlier on in the show, and then she goes, This show sucks! (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding, she says. Just kidding. (laughs) Oh, you stunned me there for a second, gorgeous bat mom. Stunned me there for a second. <coughs> I like YJ here. YJ's in British Columbia here. Tonight's guest looks like he could take down a Wolverine with his bare hands. Bare hands, man. Bare hands. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Uh, that's the reason. That's the way I want to look. Uh, because obviously I could not do that. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of, um, um, uh, I guess, a confession here. Um, I do not own a toolbox. Not only do I not own a toolbox, I don't know how to use most tools. Me either. So if I, yeah, th- see, that's good. So we need to look like we can fight off Wolverine. So people, yeah. that increases our street cred. Yeah, well, absolutely. Unless you live in a in a big city where you know you got to deal with the hipsters. That's, yes, that's exactly. the only problem. Yeah. All right. Hey, hey Brian, Mon- Brian Bowden has a new podcast call, called How Can You Not Love This Great Guy Podcast? <laughs> starting up in about six minutes here. All right. That'll be in number 19,991 for him. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's doing one right now. Hey, get it. If you can have a uh, uh, Joe Monk says, yeah. I love that. We we need to talk about that because I actually do have some stories regarding that. Well, let's get it. We'll get into this right off the okay. bat. You know, uh, we'll get into that, and uh, then we'll get into the sea monsters here. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Stu Gerson says he loves the guru's hat. Yep. And, you know, I'll tell you the reason why Ronald Murphy is such a brilliant man. He he agrees with me 100% that no one should ever eat breakfast foods for dinner. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not even that fancy French stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. If it has egg in it, it needs to be eaten before 11 o'clock in the morning. Agreed. Agreed. You know, between you and me, Guru, the, mm. some of these people eat breakfast for dinner. You know that. Oh, I know. I've you heard know. stories. I know. I've heard stories of pancakes and syrup for dinner. No, oh, no, no. Just horrible. Horrible. It is. Bacon is universal. Bacon is universal. Yeah. You know, it's like O positive or O negative blood. It's it's universal. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said it, but chicken has egg in it. That is actually pretty funny. Mm-hmm. Look at Helena there. Y'all are crazy. Had breakfast for dinner tonight. Hey, snakes Whoa. on a UFO. How you doing, buddy? Enjoying the suckiness of this show. <laughs> 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 
Oh, oh man. And Celine, that's disappointing. That's me. I'm a breakfast for dinnerer. Oh. Hmm. Yep. Brian Bowden has another new podcast starting at 1130 Pacific called I Eat Breakfast for Dinner 24-7. <laughs> live from IHOP. Yep, live from IHOP. I don't know how he does it. I don't know, man. I have no idea. I had a conversation with him on the phone the other day, and I think he was doing two podcasts while I was on the phone. It with does him. not surprise me. <laughs> and, and you know he's killing himself laughing right now oh absolutely well, hold on one second guru thank you linda swampy bat mom murray and black dragon for the amazing super chats here we go Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Always avoiding breakfast for dinner on this end. I want to remind you that if you miss more portions of this show, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, as we are rocking it on out with the guru. And we're going to get to sea monsters momentarily, but there was a question from Joe in California asking, are there any plant cryptids? Guru. Yeah, whenever I saw that question, I was so excited because whenever I was a little fella, and I'm talking about before I was even in kindergarten, my grandmother would read me this book about a somebody... It obviously was somebody in, um, I think it was it was written by a, a British fellow uh, that was um, in, uh, in Africa at the turn of the, uh, of the 18th century. It might be 19th century. Anyways, the, 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 who wrote it really was meaningless, but um, he would often talk about um, legends of man-eating plants. And those were the kind of things that were really filling my mind with you know, my imagination whenever I was a kid thinking about plants that were out there that were capable of consuming human beings. Now, I will tell you, um, so far, uh, no plants have been um, found that were capable of, uh, of uh, eating human beings. Uh, but there are some interesting tidbits that come out. Now, I, for one, am a huge um, uh, proponent of, uh, of uh, carnivorous plants. I have uh, several different varieties. I'm a big fan of the Venus flytraps. But we can get these things called pitcher plants that are quite big. So big, in fact, that um, a fairly large mouse could go into one. Um, There is a story that happened, and this is only about 10 years ago. And it's a shame that our buddy Brian Bowden is not on here because he might be able to give some input on this. But somebody was in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, and they claimed whenever they were out hunting, they found something that looked very similar to a pitcher plant. Uh, that actually had a deer within it. So how these things lure their the lure animals in there is they usually put out a foul smell. Um, I was on um, an investigation one time whenever um, we came across some naturally occurring pitcher plants. And um, I thought, you know, I, I don't know what these, I, I have to find out what the big deal is. Um, so I took a smell of it and the smell was the worst smell you could possibly come up with. It smelled like rotting meat, um, but it was so bad that it actually gave me a sinus headache for about a week. So there's plants out there that are capable of doing some extraordinary things. And like I said, I have plants here that would be capable of consuming a, a large rodent. Now, in the wild, out in the middle of nowhere, is it capable that some of these plants are are are... are you know, big enough to, to take down a bigger animal. Well, of course there are, of course. Um, but, but it is fascinating that there are plants out there that are indeed cryptozoological because they're unknown or undiscovered or lost to science. 
I want to ask you a question because there's a few researchers out there, and we've talked about it, we haven't talked about this for a long time on the show, who are looking into these trail cam videos, Ron, where mm. all of a sudden on the trail cam videos, you'll see a tree right in front of you. And then all of a sudden the tree has, say, moved over to its left or moved over to its right. And then in the next frame, it's right back to where it was. Or sometimes the trees even vanish and then reappear. Have you ever looked into that? I did. You know what? Um, So a lot of people think that the camera has somehow moved. But I've seen enough of these things to where it appears as if... um, as if like the environment itself has changed, right? I mean, that's the way it looks to you as well, right? I mean, it looks as if the the entire environment has changed and then kind of reestablished itself. Now, there's one particular area very close to where I live that I do a lot of investigations where people claim that the forest moves. That's their word whenever they're out there uh, doing some walking. And I've talked to somebody who um, is actually a principal at our local school, and she and her family became lost. Now, she, she's a, a PhD um, uh, holder, uh, so she's an intelligent woman. But she and her family became lost overnight in the woods, which is probably about 10 miles away from the nearest Walmart. And she said that she went in there, and the, the force itself seemed to move that she could not find her way back out again. And we're talking about not old growth force. We're talking about, you know, this is like third or fourth growth growth forest. These this isn't like the uh, uh, the, the 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 redwood forests of Northern California. So I have heard this many times, Dave. And the only thing that I can say is there's enough anecdotal um, uh, reports out there to suggest there's something going on. But I've heard reports of trees walking. Um, you know, that's actually a fairly ancient belief as well, too. Uh, back in the Middle Ages. It was believed that um, weeping willow trees could uproot themselves and they in turn would walk. I mean, there's some very ancient beliefs about this kind of stuff. Um, In in Greece, it believed that oak trees were able to talk to you. Um, So, yeah, I mean, we um, don't really look at the world uh, with the eyes of the ancient world anymore. You know, we don't raise our own animals. We don't have to go out into the woods to grab firewood. Well, at least most of us don't. I do. So, yeah, I know. That's what I was going to say. I'm going out yeah. this weekend. There you go. But there's an intimacy there, right? I mean, anytime you go out into the woods and you rely on the woods, there becomes this um, intimacy, this kind of exchange, this kind of norm of reciprocity. Um, we do not have a relationship with the world around us anymore. But I think that the deeper you get into that, that connection between humans and the natural world, you find out that it is almost like um, interpersonal relationships. And... Um, I think that the, the natural world can do some amazing things. And if somebody told me that there was a tree out there was that was walking almost like the Ent in uh, in uh, the Lord of the Rings, you know, from Tolkien, um, you know, he was all he was pulling on um, um, Eastern and Western European traditions to create these kind of things. So that is part of the vernacular of the paranormal about trees uh, being able to move and switch and walk and everything else. All right, let's get to Nicole's question. She is asking. What are the guru's thoughts about different spiritual rituals being used as contact modalities for ET human experience and which works best? Now I'm going to forewarn you, Nicole loves cooking breakfast for dinner. Oh, Nicole. Okay. Well, we should talk about the spiritual modalities that would allow you to do such things, Nicole, because at that point, uh, the idea of cooking dinner for breakfast, uh, Dave, you know what? If we do do a thing out in Vegas, yes, we should have, I was going to say we should have a dinner for breakfast just to show everybody, or a breakfast for dinner just to show everybody how bizarre it is. But I think what we should really do is show people, I have like a little uh, 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 conference about why not to do such Well, things. Guru, that, if we end up doing that, that's going to take a lot of alcohol, <laughs> a lot of alcohol, and I don't even that's drink. Fair. That's right. Well, actually, if there's any lucky ladies out there, whenever you and I are in town, they might be having some breakfast for dinner, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, <laughs> so anyways, Nicole, so <laughs> so, what are your thoughts about spiritual rituals? Okay, so um, I am open to the, uh, to the possibility 
that um, we can communicate. Uh, there's a transcendency there. Um, I really don't know what extraterrestrials are. I mean, just from the, the term that they're not of this world, but I've not completely ruled that out. I think that we're dealing with something that very might possibly uh, be part of our world. Um, it's just not within our our realm of thinking about how this kind of stuff works. Um, but I think there has to be a necessary transcendence there that we have to open our mind and allow ourselves to ascend to that particular um, plane um, where these other creatures uh, obviously are interacting at, especially if we're talking about interdimensionality. Um, but yeah, it's a very good question. It's a very complicated question. Um, you can look at, and a lot of the things I study is the role of the shaman in ancient worlds, uh, in ancient life ways. And um, what their take on the world was is that they had to enter a certain type of trance in order to ascend or transcend into the world of the gods or the world of, of supernatural beings. And this is something that's that's common uh, from Australia to Africa, South America. It's common in all cultures. But the idea is that you have to enter a certain state of being and a certain mindset to allow your mind to be free uh, to go places where it's not contained by the by the human body. So, interesting, interesting. You're getting a lot of play for that comment, you know, Chad Smith. Here, welcome to Playboy Radio. <laughs> I simply meant that we would be up all night talking about the different spiritual modalities to contact extraterrestrials. Uh, obviously, you did. That's <laughs> that's the way I took it. That's the way I took it. Let's get into sea monsters here. Nice. Right? Because, you know, Ron, I'm going to be honest with you. I have a deathly fear of sea monsters. And, uh, my, and you know, it, it grinds my teeth to say this, but my, my middle daughter is now debating whether or not she's going to join the Royal Canadian Navy. Oh, right. Which I think is great because I think, I think her, uh, the military would, would be right up her alley. And, you know, she loves the ocean. She loves, uh, I don't know why, you know, she was out fishing off the, uh, off, uh, off of Victoria the other day with, with, uh, her boyfriend. And I think he's a boyfriend. I can't keep up anymore. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and long story short, uh, you know, I'm like, Hey, if you see any fins, man, you get the hell out of there because, you know, Megalodon lives, you know, so never mind, just great whites. And yes, they do come into uh, the southern part of Canada here. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't like that. It just, just can't even say it properly. Ugh. Anyways, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of monsters out there that people claim to see, whether it's Ogopogo, whether it's Champ, whether it's a lot of the weird, strange creatures that are seen around uh, the Great Lakes. I mean, where do we even start with this impressive conversation? Uh, it's nearly impossible to start anywhere with this because uh, it's so uh, mired in mythologies from around the world. Now, I will tell you that, um, you know, the first on book that I wrote uh, was at my daughter's uh, behest, and that was on mermaids, you know. So that was kind of like the first time I I endeavored to investigate the worlds that, that exist under the waves. Um, but what was interesting is that we can find... Um, uh, rock paintings uh, dating back maybe 20,000 years ago in sub-Sahara Africa, whenever it was actually a lot closer to the ocean and it was very lush and tropical, that shows things um, very uh, similar to what we would call mermaids. It was, uh, you know, a humanoid body uh, with uh, the, 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 the lower part of the body that looked like a fish. Now, um, contemporary anthropologists and archaeologists would say they were representations of birds. You know, possibly they were. I mean, I guess you could kind of see that these were, were bird representations. But to me, from an initial look, it looks as if it's trying to depict something that's half human and half um, seagoing. Um, but so my interest in these, these kind of monsters began uh, with mermaids, because if we go back, that's probably the first kind of tell that was told. Um, you know, there was something like us that was living underneath the, the ocean. Um, but then we look at things like the Kraken, and we know that the giant squid is out there, the Architeuthis, right? Um, we know that it exists, but we've only known that it exists probably in the past decade. 
uh, whenever some pictures were taken and, you know, some things started to wash up on shore. Uh, but these monsters can get to uh, prodigious lengths. We know this because we have captured blue wells that have battle marks on them from them doing, um, you know, battle with these kind of uh, creatures, you know, deep in the ocean. Um, so, yeah, where do we start? We could talk about um, the giant squid. We could talk well, about here's one. Um, Megalodon. Here's one. Uh, Zune in the chat room is asking if you know anything about the Luska, which is like a half great white shark, half octopus. Yeah, the the, the shark octopus from the Sci Fi Channel. I, I, I don't know. you know I, I I don't know um, these kind of chim- chimeras, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk about as well too tonight. Is a lot of these monsters through the through the ages um, become associated with something else that is extremely terrifying. So you have these monsters that are kind of mixed up uh, to uh, have a, a kind of an extra scare factor. Um, I don't think biologically that that works. I don't think that it would, that, that nature would kind of select itself to have such a creature. Um, but what is amazing is the shark species that we are finding out there. You know, we know about the Greenland shark. We know about the goblin shark. And there's these really strange sharks that show up every now and then that appear more weird than the last one that was found. You know, we know the Greenland shark has, you know, probably one of the oldest living animals out there that maybe can go five or 600 years old. And we know that there's other sharks out there that are, you know, existed from the fossil record uh, that is still uh, uh, moping around. But um, the Megalodon is, is really one of my favorite kind of, uh, of, of sea creatures. Uh, because whenever I was a kid, originally they were supposed to be as long as a school bus and four or five people could stand up upright within their jaws. Um, now that has actually been um, kind of questioned by science that it might have had this huge, huge mouth, but they may not have been these, this bulky kind of um, uh, uh, creature. They might have been more streamlined and much more uh, shaped like a great white shark uh, so they could attack, you know, very, very swiftly. Um, if that is the case, I would say that it's possible uh, that the uh, the Megalodon could still be out there someplace. Uh, and I think a lot of people in your chat room would say the same. Um, I know that we are finding a lot of, uh, of Megalodon teeth, especially in places like um, uh, New Jersey, for whatever reason. Um, and now, of course, these are fossilized teeth. Uh, but, you know, I would think that more people that are out there beach going and peach, uh, beach combing and everything, it might be interesting if one day uh, they pull out of the sand a, a uh, Megalodon tooth that was fresh. Now, that would not be great. I'm hoping something like that happens someday. But for the Megalodon to exist, they would have to be in the, the extremely open oceans uh, where nobody would come in contact with them. Um, and unlike the movie The Meg, um, although Brian Bowden and I did have the uh, the uh, the author of the book Meg on our show a few years ago, a very intelligent human being, um, but he uh, proposed that um, these kind of megalodons, if they do exist, would uh, live in the deep uh, abysmal region of the ocean, you know, where light doesn't trickle down. Um, I don't think that is, in fact, the case. I, I think that one of the reasons these creatures would not be seen is because they would be avoiding, you know, any kind of uh, contact with, um, you know, our ships and such, because all these kind of things that human beings put out in the water have a particular sonar signature to them, and that can irritate things. So they probably try to avoid us as much as possible. But I think these creatures will be in the very open, deep ocean. And um, I think that sooner or later, if one of these things are out there, we are going to cross paths with it. Well, there is rumor that there is a super shark out there, Uh bigger than a great white, smaller than a megalodon that grows between 30, 25 and 35 feet long. Mm-hmm. And they believe that this is a, a new hybrid species mm-hmm. of what is going on in the oceans because there's a lot more weird, strange attacks that are happening mm-hmm. on these creatures and and on whales and, and right. other uh, sorts that, that lead to the fact that there is a larger shark up out there that is more aggressive. Mm-hmm. You know, could could we be seeing these popping up soon? I think so. Now, the, let's let's look at this for a, a bit. And, and, and this is a very interesting uh, point that you made. So we people have reported seeing great white sharks 
that were bit in half. We're talking about a great white shark that is the size of an apex predator out there, right? We're talking about a 20-foot great white shark that is nearly bitten in half by another animal, right? That's some scary stuff. Uh, there was also research done on a shark that had a tracking device in it. I don't know if, if you ever went over this on your show or not. Um, but all of a sudden, as they were tracking this shark, uh, the temperature changed. It got much, much warmer. And then the tracking signal took a very abrupt dive deep down into the ocean. And it's uh, the assumption is something grabbed this shark. That's why the, 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 the temperature changed on the, on the, on the, the uh, device. And then the, the, uh, the depth dropped because it was taking it down in the deep ocean to feed upon it. That's scary stuff. I mean, we know that this actually happened. We don't know what caused it, but we know that it did happen. So a couple things could be happening here about this: these super sharks. Um, from um, an adaptation point of view, uh, it's very probable that the world's oceans would not sustain a shark the size of Megalodon. Though so through natural selection over the past, you know, you know, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand years. They simply downsized, which is an extreme possibility. Or the other point that you made, uh, due to cl uh, global uh, climate change, that two um, very unlike sharks that don't encounter each other very often uh, now are forced to intermingle with each other and have interbred to create a new species of shark, which is also very probable. And we know these kind of things happen because there are now hybrids of the grizzly bear and the polar bear, which is very rarely, if ever, seen. But because of global warming, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the ecosystems of these animals are now overlapping where one time they never did. So we are now seeing these very supersized bear. Some of these bears are so large that a polar bear, now, of course, you know, these things can stand 12 feet tall. These are huge, huge animals. Some of these skulls are being found, these, these super bears, that a polar bear skull could fit inside of the mouth of these super bears. So there's strange things going on out there. Does the mating kind of happen? Like, okay, if we have, say, a six foot eight tall man and a six foot two woman, the chances or the genes that their children have will be that those children should be very tall, if not no. taller. Do you think this is what's happened in the oceanic community where maybe you get a, a 18 foot great white male, the females are bigger, you know, mm. you get a 20 foot great white female that could learn to create a larger shark. Mm -hmm. Could it work sure. the same way? Yeah. I mean, there, what would happen if we have a great white shark and a tiger shark? Or what happens if we have a great white shark and maybe another species of shark we haven't even classified yet coming together? Um, these are all extremely possible things to happen. Um, it all it all really comes down to the fact of um, what kind of species are interlapping at a particular place at a particular time. The crypto but the idea of, of a great white shark and a uh, and a tiger shark is something that's always fascinated me. Let's go into the Great Lakes here, because the Great Lakes, as we will continue this chat next hour, all right, the Great Lakes have a lot of mysteries, a lot of First Nations mysteries, a lot of legends, a lot of folklore, a lot of people believe there's portals that allow these monsters and these UFOs to come in over there. I mean, everybody knows the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald and the Witch of November, I mean, sea monsters have been seen in the lakes, especially Lake Superior. Uh, and they're a creepy place, man. They're a creepy, creepy place. And and I want to get into what you've learned about these mount these monsters out there because if you know, I still think there's a major book there for sea monsters of the Great Lakes, man. We got about twenty seconds. Yeah, um, well, I'll give you a little bit of a uh, of, of hint about it. So I was doing a conference up in uh, Sault Ste. Marie uh, in Michigan, but I never really gave lake monsters much of a thought. Um, and there, we, the, the conference was actually held on a Native American uh, uh, Indian reservation, the Ojibwa. And it was from me talking uh, to those very beautiful people and hearing their stories about lake monsters that 
uh, that prompted me to write my book on the monsters of the Great Lakes. So we'll have to talk all about that. For sure. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, an encyclopedia of cryptid information from North America and around the world. You can go on Amazon, find any of his books at Ronald L. Murphy Jr. We'll be back with the second hour of Spaced Out Radio and the guru right after this. All right, we're clear. All right, all right. Let me see what people are saying here. Boy, your people are really on. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah, they're pretty brilliant, man. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Bob Birkins called something a king shark. You know what? I like the idea of that, Bob. I don't I don't know where Bob is from, but I think that that He's is... He's from see, Quebec. Oh, yeah, okay, great. Uh, I will have to applaud him on that. I like that term very much, that, you know, two shark species that... Uh, if they, this is indeed the case, they are uh, interbreeding. I think uh, the name uh, King Shark is very appropriate. That would be a good one. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Cat wants to know when are you selling your hats, Guru? Autograph. <laughs> in uh, in Vegas. No way, man! I'm taking. I'm stealing that hat. <clears throat> there's more. There's, there's more than one. Yeah, I'm stealing that badass because that's at least a size eight. You got a good size. It is eight. It is eight. It's yeah, a, that, 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 right on the bottom. Yep. See, that'll fit me. Yes. That would fit me. Lori Oliphant, how are you? Welcome to the show. Yes, uh, the fake Robert Salas. Just want to say, great show. Hope to be on soon. You, you got too many S's on your name to be the real Robert Salas, just so you know. Right. And uh, what else we got here? God, I hate sea monsters, man. Hate them. Yeah, sea monsters are scary, man. I, I love the ocean. But I'm actually very afraid of the ocean as well. Oh, man. Tell me about it. Hey, thank you, GF, 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 G, for that awesome super chat. Really appreciate that. And uh, thank you for your love and support of this show, man. Thank you. That's awesome. <clears throat> uh, we're going to do a little bit more Sea Monsters, GFG. Uh, then I will get to your question uh, right after that. Uh, I've swam in two lakes that have sea monsters in them. And now thinking about it, that was just dumb. Uh, what mm -hmm. happened to the moose oil? My beard, I trim my beard. I don't moose oil when my beard is this small. Uh, any reports of earthquakes in Newfoundland tonight? I haven't checked. I haven't checked. There's a new podcast for Brian. Earthquake Central with Brian Bowden. <laughs> God. I don't know how he does it, man. I don't know how he does it. He's on the, he's on the scene now. He's on the scene, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. The boat, the Bowden copter gets him everywhere he needs to go. <laughs> he already has an ID around his neck and everything oh, like that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely he does. <clears throat> hey, Dirty Filth, how you doing? How you feeling, buddy? Give me a thumbs up if you're doing okay. Dirty, dirty filth, what's with you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, Kira, Dave hates the ocean. Hates the ocean. It's nice in pictures. 
It's beautiful in pictures. But you know what? Behind every beautiful wave, there is a shark willing to eat you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Crunch time. How you doing, buddy? Joshua S., good to see you. Sir Bryden Bowden, the Bowden Copter en route. Thanks, Brian. There it is. Thanks, Brian, for that awesome super chat, buddy. We love you, man. He's such a good dude. He is. We got to come on sometime together too. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. He's always so busy, though. Remember, he he blew us off last time. You know, the last time I was supposed to be on or the last time I came on the show, he was supposed to be on here with me. But I, I if I can remember correctly, he blew us both off. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that's because he was starting eight new podcasts. That's what, that's what I, he didn't have time for us anymore. No, no. Hi, Char. How are you? Good to see you. We got about uh, 45 seconds here, buddy. Akira loves the ocean. I, I love the ocean too, Kira. Kira also eats breakfast for dinner, so. Uh, you know, some things you have to overlook. Uh no, I think I could probably overlook that. No, 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 I'm not overlooking that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right. A uh, big thank you to Brian, <laughs> GFG, 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 Linda, Swampy, Batmom, Murray, and Black Dragon for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to support this show, what we do here each and every night on the show. A uh, big thank you to all the veterans tuning in. We absolutely love you. You always have a home here on Spaced Out Radio and to all our regulars. Much love in the chat room. Here we go with Hour 2 and the Guru. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with Hour number 2 of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, at KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Sangfroid. Sangfroid is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram spaced out radio show the crypto guru ronald murphy is here talking sea monsters and monsters all night long as the guru is a fan favorite of all of our listeners here are some of our highest rated shows and you can find all of his books on amazon ronald l murphy jr guru welcome back hey thanks a lot dave and we are blowing through this my friend already 107 in the a.m I know it is. It is busy, busy, busy here. It is and nonstop, that, just question after question. This is great. That's why we love our guru time, my friend. Hey, sea monsters, mm-hmm. Great Lakes. What's going on over there? Why is it so weird? Oh well, what is so cool about the Great Lakes? Uh, in uh, these are all glacial lakes, and what is so cool about that is that at the same time the Great Lakes were created is the same time the uh, the Lake Champlain was created and the same time that Loch Ness was created. So something was going on in that very specific geological period to allow very strange things to happen. Um, from, you know, the very beginning, water has always been seen mystical. It always been seen as either a conduit to the other world or a way to the underworld. So in our imaginations, in our human imaginations, uh, water has always been seen as a gateway or a doorway 
So what's unique about these bodies of water, like Champlain, like Lake Champlain or Lake Loch Ness, is that they're occurring in places that really um, shouldn't. These kind of waterways shouldn't be there. Um, Loch Ness is in the Highlands of Scotland, very, very unusual. And Lake Champlain is this massive lake tucked away there in up, you know, upstate New York on the Canadian border. Now the Great Lakes is something that is entirely different. Um, actually. The Great Lakes is kind of a misnomer because it should really be called an inland sea because they are all connected in some way or the other. Um, the the other thing is that places like Lake Michigan and Lake uh, Superior in particular is that these are not typical lake environments. Uh, these are environments where you would be more closely seeing um, ocean type of things happening. Uh, storms rage uh, very wild there. We have unbelievable surf in those areas, and we have a great diversity of animal life. Also, these lakes are very deep, which a lot of people don't understand either. Um, so with all that being said, uh, doorway to an under, the other world and these, these this massive amount of water in very unusual places, that is all added a little bit to the mystery. Now, the other thing about these Great Lakes is that they were, whenever I talk about the last glaciers retreating, we're only talking about 14,000 years ago, which in the blink of an eye, you know, it, it, it's a second in geological time. Um, in my one book on lake monsters that I wrote, um, I, I, you know, I posited that, you know, if um, whenever the Paleo Indians were here, whenever they had migrated over, they were already here for, you know, a few thousand years before the Great Lakes were formed. And they could have visually watched the lakes filling up. Um, and I think a lot of our flood stories from around the world um, occurred during this time whenever the glaciers were retreating and, you know, ocean water was spilling in. I think that we can probably pinpoint a lot of our um, our flood motifs back to about 14,000 years ago, and I'd be very comfortable in saying that. So not only were they able to watch these things fill up, but it also created a new environment for them, you know, something new there. Now, one of my beliefs is this, and, um, you know, it could be complete conjecture or whatever, but, but this is one of my beliefs. Um, over in England, especially around the Devon area, um, one of the greatest finds of oceanic fossils uh, is on that particular beach. Uh, the first uh, plesiosaur that was identified was found on that beach. So is it possible that the waters around uh, England uh, during the uh, last Ice Age could have been the home for at least a remnant population of aquatic reptiles. You know, is it possible? Um, now, if it is possible, if we only even had a remnant population of aquatic reptiles at that time, is it possible that whenever the, the Great Lakes or whenever the uh, glaciers receded, and it opened up these channels into places to form like Loch Ness. Some of these creatures then went into them. Um, that could indeed be where the idea, at least the idea, the myth of the Loch Ness monster came from. And through folklore and through tradition, it was told and retold to the point that we still believe that there's a, a plesiosaur-like animal in Loch Ness. Or is it possible that they did indeed enter Loch Ness, and it was sealed off, and at least you had a small population there. Um, I, again, like I said, this is all speculation and conjecture, but it makes some sort of sense about where these things came from. Now, whenever we talk about the, uh, the Great Lakes, that's a whole entirely different story. We're talking about a massive amount of water. Uh, actually, if you would empty all the Great Lakes, um, all of North America would be up about ankle deep. It, it, that's a lot of water uh, to take from that from that area. Um, and the First Nations have so many tells about creatures that live in there. Uh, the the Meshapishu is one of the ones that they tell about this great water lynx or water panther that inhabits um, uh, Lake Superior. And uh, so there is not only these kind of folklore uh, things that come out, but also people have witnessed things there as well, too. Uh, you know, Lake Champlain has a plethora of uh, sightings year after right. year. 
And uh, even in uh, Lake uh, Michigan, uh, back in 1955, there was a report of a child being attacked by a shark. Uh, and it's very possible that a shark could enter Lake Michigan, especially a bull shark, uh, by going up the Mississippi River. So let us just say that these Great Lakes here in North America are so unbelievably mysterious that even in the 21st century, people are still th- seeing things that should not be there. But, you know, even reports up to today, we're no. seeing dinosaur, dragon-like creatures that are swimming through the water with with spikes on their backs, with, you know, some claiming to have wings on their backs, mm-hmm. especially in the Great Lakes. I mean, mm-hmm. we're seeing, like, stuff that was drawn up in, in 1500s folklore mm-hmm. here. That's right. Yeah, so when the one you're talking about, that's absolutely the case. At the beginning of the show, you know, I touched a little bit on um, uh, the Chupacabra. And if you look at the Mishapishu uh, up there in uh, Lake Superior, it's almost a carbon copy of what the original um, uh, uh, Chupacabra was said to look like. A very stout little body. Sometimes it has a long serpentine towel. Sometimes it doesn't. But it has these stereotypical, almost iconic spikes all over its body. Um Sometimes it even has the ability to fly, which leads some people to think that this creature could also be some sort of remnant uh, memory of uh, UFO activity in that area as well, too. Um, But whatever is going on, like I said, it's embedded within the oral tradition of the Native Americans up there. And that is something that I pay a lot of attention to because these people have intrinsically been tied to this land for, you know, at least 14, 15,000 years. And, you know, we do not know how far these traditions go back. It's very possible that they're telling and retelling stories that have been there since the very beginnings, the genesis of the Great Lakes themselves. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Okay. So when we look at, say, the the monsters of of Lake Superior or Lake Huron or, or even going into Lake Ontario and Lake Michigan and Erie, do we look at, you know, these creatures as the same as what we are seeing in Lake Champlain or Okanagan Lake where Ogopogo is. You can. I see that is the thing. Um, I tend to see, think that these are uh, the same, whatever they may be. I, I, again, going back to, to my, to my, at least my speculation is that whenever these great lakes opened up, when these lakes opened up, and allowed salt water to go in, um, there may possibly have been sea life that we thought was extinct entering these kind of openings. Um, We know in Vermont, uh, up in Lake Champlain, we know that at least a few wells entered that lake because the St. Fossil of Vermont is a well that was discovered on the banks of Lake Champlain. It was like a beluga well. So we do know that these kind of big creatures got into this area. Is it possible that something that fed upon these wells followed them in? Well, absolutely it is. We do not know what the world was like 14,000 years ago. We have no idea what kind of creatures may still have been out there. And um, it's very possible they, these creatures, like, like I said, and I'm not saying it was a plesiosaur, but it could have been some sort of extinct reptile, very much like the plesiosaur that through, you know, um, uh, natural selection and evolution had had become a different animal altogether. But it's very possible they were still looking in the very shallow waters right off the coasts of North America and England. Um, and whenever the ocean, op- you know, whenever these gateways opened up and the ocean ran in, that they either were swept in or they followed prey animals in there. It's a whole new environment. And by these creatures entering that environment, they now become the apex predators and in control of that environment. Extremely possible, my friend. All right, let's get to a question here from GFG, 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 GFG. Have you had any banshee stories? She shrieks as a forewarning for family members' death. Also, Ron, are you aware of the Abhartok? an Irish vampire legend that inspired Bram Stoker's Dracula. Let's start with the Banshees. All right, yes. Yeah. So Banshees, and I do have Banshee stories on my in my On Fairies book as well because the word Banshee, uh, the she actually, the S-H-E-E, uh, means fairy, and the ban part is female, so it's a female uh, fairy. 
Um, so, and these are creatures because they're fairies that they straddle the two worlds at once, which means that they have knowledge of, of what this world offers to us. Um, that is the unique thing about, uh, fairies and the unique thing about ghosts that a lot of people have tended, tended to forget is that whenever ghosts were, was, was part of the, the, of the oral tradition and the ancient tradition, um, in, in, in Europe, that they were able to bring knowledge of um, the other world into our world. So whenever they were, uh, uh, you know, the ominous uh, premonitions of death, that's where they would get it from is because they were from a different world and time is not linear. So they kind of know all things at all times. But absolutely, um, sometimes they would scream out a person's name. Uh, sometimes people would see a banshee at a creek washing the clothes of somebody that was going to be dying too. So I've heard stories about uh, there would be a, a haggard woman uh, standing over a, a, a creek and she was trying to scrub the blood out of this one particular person's um, uh, surcoat and that person was still alive. So that was kind of like uh, the precursor to what was going to happen. But um, yeah, of course. So banshees, um, if you want to read more about them, like I said, my, my book on fairies has a whole uh, a section on there. Now, the thing about um, vampires, uh, uh, the Dracula legend, and I'll go even one better here. So Bram Stoker was a sickly boy, um, and he spent a lot of his formative years actually laid up in bed, you know, his, his proverbial sick bed, if you will. And outside of his window in Ireland, was a graveyard. Uh, so he got to see, you know, graves all of his life. And he also had this fascination and this pre, you know, the, the, you know, he was always thinking about his own health. So he has this kind of relationship with the dead already, but he was also a very intelligent man as well. There is a, a particular fairy that occupies the wilds of us, of, uh, of Ireland. Uh, not only are they part of the land itself, but they also have a castle there, which is extremely reminiscent of the whole vampire mythos. But that fairy's name, of course, it's in Gaelic, and I, I can't begin to pronounce it, but it's two words. Uh, the first syllable of that word is pronounced something like drac or drock, and then the last part of that, the last syllable is eula. So you come Dracula. Uh, from that. Um, so whenever we talk about um, uh, Vlad the Impaler, uh, uh, you know, the Dracul uh, from Romania as being the, um, the precursor or the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the uh, idea, the figurehead for this particular work uh, by Bram Stoker, uh, it may not be all on that particular person. I think he's pulling from Irish folklore as well that has a very deep um, uh, idea and belief system in um, these creatures that were also um, uh, consume human blood. Oh, that sounds just creepy. Yeah. Creepy. Well, these, these Dracula fairies would uh, lay. So, Ireland, there's a lot of desolate area in, in Ireland, the same way within Scotland. Uh, we think that everything is built up. So, there's a lot of desolate area. So, these particular fairies would lay out along like the one road that would go through a particular moorland and they would wait for an unsuspecting traveler to come by. And then they would of course grab them and feed upon them and everything. Um, these are very, you know, morbid type of tells, but we can find these in traditions around the world, which makes me believe that there is some sort of truth to these things. All right, let's get to Carrie Ann's question. She is asking, are there any monster clams? I wow yeah you know what I never thought about that I think one of the reasons why people um, don't associate uh, monster clams uh, with uh, something that's you know frightening is because they can't you know move around as readily um, I, I seem to remember a story whenever I was a kid about a diver I think it was off the coast of California that almost got trapped within a giant clam I, I, I don't have any more specifics than that but um I'm interested why that person asked that question um, because I've never had anybody ask me a question about a clam before. Well, why not? I mean, could you imagine being trapped or like that diver earlier this year off of uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts, 
who accidentally got scooped up by a humpback whale. Yes, let yes, a, let yes, alone, yes. What the hell is he doing diving for lobsters when there's great whites all over that area? Right. Yeah. I mean, yep, when, you're exactly. in, when you're in Provincetown, and I've only been there once, if you're walking along the ocean, there are giant signs saying these waters are patrolled by great whites. Do not go swimming in them. Yep. You know, yep. That, that's enough well, warning see, for me, man. That's right. See, I, I think a lot of our listeners um, and a lot of people, whenever I go uh, do talks, they don't understand that the oceans you find in like Atlantic City and Myrtle Beach and Virginia Beach are far different than other beaches around the world. Okay. We have, we have, um, vacation places, but there are some places where the beaches and the waters are very, very wild and untamed. And those places are the things that scare me, but these are also the places that I'm drawn to the most. I'm drawn to the places like in Northern Maine and up into the uh, Maritimes of, of Canada where people actually work to make a living out of the ocean and nobody is going up onto the shores with uh, sun hats on and sunglasses and sunbathing. You know, these are waters that are still wild. And uh, and as, as an investigator, I always look out into those waters and wonder what is patrolling underneath the surface of those waters. I don't want to know. But you you do want to know, but the thing is, though, if you had knowledge of knowing, then you don't want to be around it at all. Do you know what I mean? Like, water is a mystery. Like, we probably know more about the surface of the moon than we know about our oceans. Um, we have almost everything mapped, but there's still so many mysteries about what's going on. We really don't know what the deepest part of the ocean is yet. Uh, one of your uh, uh, listeners had remarked about the possibility of being like this ocean within an ocean uh, that that apparently is absolutely true, you know, that there's this, um, uh, uh, this particular volume of water that has a different density than the water around it. So we don't even know what kind of life forms might live within that ocean uh, that's under the ocean itself. Um, and then um, the idea of things that can leave that water, uh, such as the bull shark, and enter into fresh water. And that's a whole new ball game at this point. To think that there's things out there in the oceans that now can enter into our relatively safe world. You know, that's what happened uh, with uh, back in 1916 with uh, in uh, New Jersey which uh, spurred the uh, book of Jaws along whenever some sort of shark came into the freshwater river and, uh, you know, killed a few people. Oh, two minutes left. A.A. Ron wants to know, what's your thoughts on sirens of the ocean? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, well, not only in the ocean. Uh, we actually have a lot of uh, uh, traditions of, uh, of mermaids and sirens in rivers as well. Um, not only in Africa, but uh, I live in Pennsylvania, and the Schuylkill River has actually had one report of a mermaid sighting in it. That's an absolutely true uh, true story. Um, I've also heard somebody tell me a report that they are, are completely serious whenever they told me that they had a mermaid sighting in a man-made lake outside of Reno, Nevada. Now, if that is the case, then we must be talking about something that is uh, occurring within the water itself. Uh, and that's whenever you come up with the, this idea of the elemental, uh, which uh, the great uh, alchemist uh, Paracelsus believed that mermaids were, that they were an intelligence that inhabited the water itself. So they were um, kind of like, uh, you know, the, 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 the spirit that inhabited that particular water. Uh, again, that's another rabbit hole we can go down to. But um, as of, uh, you know, the early 2000s, uh, there was um, uh, witch doctors that had to be called out in Africa to um, to exercise the uh, mermaids out of a particular river because they said well, they were attacking the construction workers of a dam there. Quickly from Nicola, 40 seconds. Uh, Nicola lives in upstate New York. Have you ever heard of any lake monsters in the Finger Lakes? No, I have not. I have not heard. Now, remember, the Finger Lakes are made at the exact same time. Uh, these are all uh, uh, scoured out by the, the, the glacial uh, uh, retreat. Um, but I'm not sure how deep the, uh, the Finger Lakes are. And the other unique thing about the Finger Lakes is that they do not have a direct connection to the ocean in any way. 
Um, so I think that might be one of the reasons why we don't have that same kind of uh, um, mystique to them as these other lakes do. Guru, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Halfway through Spaced Out Radio tonight, the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. We got him for another hour here. We're going to continue your monster talk with your questions. If you're in one of our chat rooms or on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. You can find all of his books on Amazon, including his On series. We call him the guru around here, and the guru speaking right after this break on Spaced Out Radio. All right, Guru, we're clear. All righty, all righty. It's going well, my friend. It is. You know, it really is. We're having a good night here. <laughs> hey, Major Lee, how you doing? Uh, Max Hawthorne. Max Hawthorne is the guy we had on talking about Megalodon and this super shark. No, right. Excaliperful, Pikachu, good to see you. Hmm, what was that? Dave Scott's voice can bust at my eardrums, man. Sorry about that. Peppa H, how you doing, buddy? Hmm. <coughs> <coughs> Good times, Guru. Yes, it is. Good times. You got any conferences coming up? I don't, man. Uh, you know, Mothman was canceled. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's just one of those really weird things. I've had a few conferences. I'll be up at Hillview Manor uh, next month and then the month after that. But uh, I'm just doing, like, little things. All the big stuff has pretty much been canceled. Right on. That's why we have to wait until next year. That sucks, man. It does. I love reading these things. I'd really do. Sir Brian weighing in. We need an SOR conference. I do. I do agree that we. I, I like your idea, but I do like the idea as well as having a a real conference with that. You and Brian need to start up a Guru Con. <laughs> guru Con. That is totally mm-hmm. what is needed. Is Guru Con. I've been talking to um, Kat uh, about uh, something like that as well, too. Not not a guru con. I, I appreciate that. But I, I was talking to Kat about having some sort of uh, conference uh, going on. I would love to see a conference being held at a university. I really would. Um, I think that if you get enough intelligent uh, guests lined up that can talk about this, you know, um, from an academic point of view, enough so it doesn't seem like there's – too much woo. Well, you got to have a little bit of woo there. Um, I, I think that would break down a few borders that are still standing. Right. Right. That would be cool, man. It would. That would be so cool. Uh, Cat Ward, thank you so much for the amazing super chat. G West, thank you for the amazing super chat as well. Really do appreciate the love and support, man. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, Sasquatch, how you doing? Good to have you back. Robert Moore, good to see you, my friend. And who else has uh, come on in here? Um, we're good right now. We are good right now. We got uh, about 90 seconds, brother. We're running. Mm-hmm. Be Hoff. Good to have you here, Flat Earther. Mm-hmm. 
That beard is looking gorgeous tonight. <laughs> I've got a little bit of white in it too, uh, a little bit of yeah. uh, salt in it, you know. Oh yeah, that looks that looks uh, healthy. Nah. Looks healthy. Hey, Kevin's beard is back. Look at that, Kevin's beard from Texas. Gotta love Kevin's beard. How you doing, my friend? How's the hog hunting going? Give me an update. We got one minute, Guru. All right. <clears throat> I don't know. Vinny is on a break again. I don't know where the hell he is. Where's Fap tonight, too? All right. Big thank you to Black Dragon, Murray, Bat Mom, Swampy, Linda, GFGFGFGFG, Brian, Kira, Cat, and G West for the amazing super chats tonight. We really love and appreciate the support of SOR. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our regulars who are here tuning us in right now, like Gorgeous Adventures with Beth. Good to see you. And uh, we love you all. Thank you so much for making this show so much fun. Hi, Ross Lambda. And, of course, to all the veterans out there, we always make sure you have a safe home here with Spaced Out Radio. We love you, and thank you so much for all of your services. We appreciate it. We're going to get going with the Guru here in three seconds. Stay tuned. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. I want to remind you that if you've seen or heard most of this show, check out our free archives. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on with the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. Ronald L. Murphy Jr., all of his books can be found on Amazon, so make sure you check it on out. You definitely want to grab his on series. He's an award-winning author as well. Guru, we're going to start with a question from RB here in the chat room. What is your thoughts about Mothman? I grew up a couple of hours from there. Yeah, you know what? I've only been to Point Pleasant one time, and that was a few years ago, uh, to speak at the conference. Um, Interesting place. Uh, Now, another thing that we haven't talked about today uh, is the possibility that some of these creatures are not only, you know, tulpas we talked about, but what happens if they are creations from our own um, uh, uh, inventions, so to speak. So we know that there's a TNT plant there, um, but there also are rumors that nuclear waste was stored in that area as well. So is it possible that some of these things that we call cryptids might be mutations of, of otherwise uh, readily known uh, and identified animals? Uh, as of late, a lot of people have been proposing that the the, uh, the Mothman has been nothing more than a sandhill crane. Um, and that's really almost a definitive belief now whenever we, we talk about science that uh, there was, you know, this was on the, the, the migration pattern of Sandhill cranes. Uh, somebody saw one and then the uh, t- telephone game uh, began. And by the time it, you know, went down the wire, it became some sort of, you know, flying cryptid with big red glowing eyes. Um, I think there might be more to it than that than it meets the eye. Um I think uh, the Mothman is some again uniquely American. If you look at it from that perspective, but if you look at it from a more worldview, we have creatures like uh, the Lamassu in Greek culture. We have the Owlman in Celtic cal- uh, culture of like Cornwall. So we have these ideas that there are flying humanoids out there with these kind of red glowing eyes that every now and then interact with humanity. Um, and I am of the, uh, of the opinion that the Mothman resides in the same realm as the Owlman and these other kind of creatures that, you know, for lack of a better word, have been, have been identified as demons throughout the years. They come from some sort of place uh, within our world 
that uh, every now and then, again, I use the term, seeps into our world, whether we're talking about interdimensionality, whether we talk about portals or what have you, but for, somehow they're able to leave their world and enter into our world. Hmm. Are there those two different worlds, though? Yeah. See, the way I look at it is this. I look at reality as almost like an onion, okay? So you can take off a layer, and you can see through that layer. It's, you know, it's pretty translucent. Um, but the deeper you go, the less – you can't see the whole way through. So you can see a little bit of everything fuzzy through the first layer, and it gets a little bit more cloudy as you go down. And I think that that's really the way reality is. I think that we're all layered one up on top of another, and every now and then those layers kind of fade into each other. All right, let's go to TFV, who is asking, do you think the government has engineered a lookalike cryptid copied, say, a Bigfoot or a rake? Uh, I don't think there's been any engineering going on, but I am quite positive, almost 100% positive, 98% positive, that our government knows about these kind of creatures uh, far more than they're letting on. Um, you know, last time I was on the show, I talked about um, this field manual the U.S. Army put out that uh, um, uh, discussed the possibilities of um, a, a Sasquatch living in Northern California. And then if uh, the soldiers that were training up there encountered that particular sort of wildlife, what to do and what not to do. So I think the military and I think the government does know about these things. But as far as this engineering goes, I don't think that's going on. All right, Jennifer is asking, have you ever heard of rawhide and bloody bones? My aunt used to scare me with that story. Anything to it, what could it be? Jennifer, that would make the perfect name for a cowboy bar. I do not know anything about rawhide and bloody bones. I This must be something very colloquial. Um, I don't know where Jennifer Hawkins is from. Uh, but I we need to hear more about this story, Dave. Dave, she needs a, she can't leave us hanging. Well, we'll see what she puts in the in yeah. the uh, chat room to f uh, fire us yeah. up about this one. That one just kind of, you know, scares me just looking well, at it. I mean, yeah. well, what I'm thinking, it. I'm wondering if this has almost like um, uh, the 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 Wendigo type of. I was just going to say that Wendigo state shifter, yeah, Wendigo and uh, and uh, Skinwalker type of creatures. That's what it almost seems like. That's what it seems like to me too. Yeah, you know. I mean, do you have any updates or any new stories on the Windigo or, or, uh, no, no, but they, there is a lake. I think it's in, uh, Northern Wisconsin called Lake Windigo. I need to get there so badly. Um, the part of the folklore is that the spirit of a Windigo actually inhabits that lake. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, folklore and uh, urban legends going around that if you wait there, you can hear the things screaming at you or talking to you. But I know on, um, on, on YouTube and on social media, because I do a lot of research on there to see what is kind of, kind of have my finger on the pulse of what's going on in the paranormal world. And right now, the Skinwalker and the Wendigo is huge. And you can find a lot of um, uh, footage on there of people claiming they can hear something calling out to them, something screaming out to them, whether it's their name or somebody yelling for help out in the middle of nowhere. Interesting. Mm. There's nothing freaky about that. You know what? I'm, the first time I, I started to watch these shows, uh, the, these these reports, I, I said the same thing. I said, there's really, no, I mean, I was honest. I said, there's nothing freaky about that. But then they were showing out like they were like 30 miles from the nearest road. And they were riding their horse, and the horse was kind of acting a little bit jittery. And then it would come to a dead stop, and somebody would say, hello, or help, or call the person's name out. That's terrifying. You know, that's absolutely terrifying. I love this question by Jenny. How about cryptid pigs? Yep, absolutely. You know, uh, there was a gentleman that took a, 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 a wild hog. I believe that was in Texas that I think they said it weighed somewhere around. Oh, my hunters out there. You'll have to let me know. I'm thinking like this hogzilla is what they called it was something around 1,200 pounds. I mean, it, it was a massive animal. It was almost like, you know, um, uh, uh, Pleistocene type of, of, of big megafauna. Um, and pigs can get very big. Um, and a lot of the pigs that are running rampant uh, in the south of, uh, of America 
uh, is um, their um, their feral farm animals uh, that have uh, you know resorted to a more uh, 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 wild behavior, uh, and sometimes there's interbreeding going on as well. But um, we know that our farm pigs can get very very big. And I think that's probably what happened is they somebody shot a uh, a um, uh, a farm animal that had escaped. But yeah, there, there are definitely reports of big giant hogs out there. Um, one of the uh, best places to look at hog stories um, about these kind of creatures terrorizing people is in Australia of all places because they have quite a hog problem there as well. Well, everything kills you in Australia. Everything absolutely kills you in Australia. There is nothing there that wants to give you a hug. Even the cutest things that they have there. Like, I would love to reach down into a creek over there and pick up a platypus and give it a hug. But do you know what it would do? It would take that little poisonous spur of it, and it would scratch my eyes out, and it would yep. poison me. Yep. Who does that? Who does that? Yep. Or, you know, I would love to grab a koala bear up and, you know, rub its nose, but it's going to kill me. Yes, yes. And, you know, I'm surprised that anybody lives past the age of 35 in Australia. Absolutely. I'm very surprised by that, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. can't, you can't swim in the ocean because nope. everything there wants to kill you. You can't go on land because everything there wants to kill you. You can't swim in your own backyard pool because you got crocodiles. Yeah. Okay? You, yeah. Can't, you can't swim anywhere. That's right. Yeah. Horrible place. People getting the poisonous snakes out of their mm-hmm. bathrooms, you know. Um, you can't uh, even you can't even take a, a a good bathroom break, sit down and take a good bathroom break without a poisonous snake slithering up the toilet plumbing. You it, know what I'm saying? Exactly, exactly. You can't do it. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I would love to visit that place, but now that I'm now that we're talking about this more, I don't think that's going to happen. No, no, not me, no. man. Not me. All right, let's get to alien critter. Guru, do you believe that most paranormal activity can be explained by science? Um, I don't think that it can be explained by science, but I think that it should be considered by science. Uh, I think there should be documentation being used. I think the scientific method should be employed because in order for us to be accepted uh, by the mainstream, we need to have some sort of proof or some sort of documentation. So that is my kind of way of thinking about that. I think that we should have more of a um, of a uh, relationship uh, with the scientific community. And I think the scientific community, and I'm not talking just about, you know, physics and, and, and things like that, but I'm talking also about psychology and sociology, um, the kind of humanities. They should have um, uh, some sort of open dialogue with us as well, too, because there is this all this information out there that is that is being unprocessed about why people see the things they do and what happens whenever people encounter these types of things. By the way, Ozzy Ange says, guys, relax. I'm in my 50s. I'm alive. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. Oi, oi, oi. Wow. Well, I'll tell you. Okay. I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I, I've seen Ange's pictures on Instagram, there is no way she's in her 50s. Right. No way See? she's in her 50s. I, I'm calling serious uh, uh, shenanigans on that one. Right. So she's either lying to us. Well, she has to be lying to us. And I'll tell you why she's lying to us. Because even their football over there, they play football without any kind of protection whatsoever. They're trying to kill you know? each other. They're trying to kill each other. Exactly. Even, even people over there want to kill other people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, dangerous place, that Australia. It is. Yeah. All right, race fan is asking, have you heard of any lake monsters in Washington State? Uh, You know what? I'm sure that I probably have, uh, and I will be quite honest. The Pacific Northwest is one of those places that I have to go explore, but I've never been there. So I'm going to have to um, to, uh, um, be honest and say that I'm ignorant on that matter, but hopefully one day I'll be able to get up some investigations up there. All right. Uh, Nicola is asking, Guru, are there any colleges that have cryptozoology courses? Zero. Now, I will tell you this. Occasionally, occasionally, you will have a college that will offer a cryptozoology course as an elective. But there is no colleges that will uh, grant you a degree in cryptozoology. Um, So what you have to do is you have to kind of go about it your own way. Um, now, my daughter is in a, um, an advanced placement biology class, 
in her first class that she had, the teacher ca- talked about cryptozoology. And she stated that there is possibilities that animals out there um, that we do not know about exist. And what she was trying to point out is that it's, it's, it, it's good to keep an open mind about things, uh, especially whenever you're in the world of science. I think cryptozoology is something that should be studied. Uh, there are a lot of good people out there who are looking for And now, cryptozoology, I have to tell you real quick, is not all, all about the woo. It's not all about Bigfoot. It's not all about, um, you know, um, these giant reptilian creatures living in, in, in Loch Ness. Um, cryptozoology actually is looking for animals that uh, had lived here one time and they're no longer here, usually by by people. You know, usually that's the case. There are very good people out there looking for the giant auk, which was a flightless uh, uh, water-dwelling bird. Uh, people are looking for the um, the uh, ivory-billed woodpecker from down around Louisiana area. Uh, there are people who are looking for stellar sea cows out in the Arctic Ocean, which were these humongous uh, manatees. Uh, that went extinct at the hands of man um, probably in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So it doesn't all have to be about the woo. What it is, uh, cryptozoology is is trying to sort out what kind of environment these kind of creatures needed, um, how they interacted with that environment, what happened whenever they left that environment, and is there enough of that previous environment left to sustain at least a remnant population of them? So it all is not about people dressed up like they're going on safari uh, looking for Bigfoot. There are actually people out there that are looking for animals that aren't quite as um, as uh, as fun, I should say, as, as our friend uh, the Bigfoot and the Yeti. All right. So what do you think the tie is? between Bigfoot and UFOs? This is a question from Brian. Brian, all right. Okay, so it's cool uh, that here in Western Pennsylvania, uh, whenever I was a kid back in 1977, we had one of the worst snowstorms ever. School was closed for about two weeks. It was so bad that the postage didn't even go through. I mean, it was really that bad here. Um, What was so interesting is, after that winter ended, there was a outburst of UFO sightings and um, Bigfoot uh, sightings. Uh, Stan Gordon wrote a book on this, and it's called The Silent Invasion. So if anybody wants to read about this kind of stuff that happened in Western Pennsylvania, that is the book to get. So what happened is, is not only there's UFOs being uh, reported and Bigfoot's being reported, but they're now being reported in the same place at the same time. In a, a place called Fayette County, uh, which is not too far from me, probably about a half an hour drive, uh, there was a report about a Bigfoot scene walking a um, fence line in a field. And as it was making its way, a UFO also appeared in the sky. Um, not only did a UFO appear in the sky, but the Bigfoot creature was holding a sphere that began to emit a, a glow, uh, some sort of light, some sort of uh uh, radiant light was coming from it as if it was communicating with it. Um, also, uh, around that same time, up in Lake Erie, there was a Bigfoot reported on the beach uh, by a, a large group of, of, of people uh, whenever a UFO was landing at the same time. And the UFO was described as causing a mini earthquake uh, whenever it came in for a landing. So, I'm lucky as a researcher and as somebody that has worked closely with people like Stan Gordon that um, there was something going on in the 1970s in Western Pennsylvania that had a very unique relation between the Bigfoot and the UFO phenomenon that has continued with us to this day, at least in memory of those events. What's your favorite cryptid? Oh, you got to go with Bigfoot. I mean, I wouldn't be here unless it was Bigfoot. You know, that's really what got me out there. And I don't know what the attraction is. I really don't. Because as a kid, I always liked dinosaurs. I mean, I always did. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like the Loch Ness Monster. But there's just something about Bigfoot because it's so like us in so many ways. It is One person asked me, <coughs> excuse me, if I considered uh, Bigfoot my alter ego. 
I think whenever you get right down to brass tacks, that might be indeed the thing. Um, Bigfoot represents uh, freedom that we don't have. Uh, it represents of, you know, quitting your job and growing your beard long and living out in the woods. Um, he doesn't work nine to five. You know, he he makes his own rules. And there's something very attractive to that. It, it, Bigfoot and, and these, these wild men are so like us. And we could be them, but we cannot leave that connection with this world behind. So I guess in a way, Bigfoot is my alter ego. There are a lot of really cool cryptid stories that are out there. Before I get to Jennifer's question, how can we never hear anything about the the alligators underneath New York City anymore? I know. Well, that was a big thing. A it huge... was. Yeah. I remember in the 70s, they were actually even making uh, schlock films about that stuff, if you can remember. You know, somebody would come back from uh, vacation in Florida, and the father said, you know, he doesn't want the alligator anymore, and flushes it down the toilet, and somehow it either becomes contaminated or it grows, you know, to prodigious sizes, and it starts, you know, feeding upon the denizens of New York City. I have no idea what happened to that. Uh, the idea of snakes in the sewers, all this kind of stuff. Um, we probably just simply moved on to bigger and better things. And you have to also remember, uh, New York uh, City was going through a bit of a, an identity crisis whenever this was going on. And now, you know, they cleaned up Times Square. It really kind of, they really kind of polished themselves up a little bit. And I think that that kind of faded then whenever New York changed its image. Well, you know what? I, I miss those stories. I really do. We got three and a half minutes. Jennifer, I miss the story too. Jennifer is asking... Are there any urban goblin reports that you know of, like on train tracks and subway tunnels? Well, well, you're talking about like an actual goblin, I would assume. Um, I've not heard anything on train tracks or in subways, uh, but I was doing a conference and this young person came up to me. They were in their in their mid-teens and he had a goblin sighting for me. And I said, uh, so I, I want to hear, hear what happened. And he said that he went out to make a sandwich in the uh, in the kitchen he opened up the refrigerator, he closed it, and in the hallway, he saw what he said was a goblin, a very small little creature that was sitting there watching him. And the, the goblin was almost stunned as if it came upon this guy, uh, and um, there was no intention of it happening. But uh, the goblin then simply disappeared into a, a wall of light as if a portal opened or some sort of doorway opened. But that was the first goblin report that I ever had. Now, there was another report that I had. I don't know if you could call this as goblins or not, uh, but a gentleman was taking a walk up on the Chestnut Ridge, which is a place in western Pennsylvania uh, that I do a lot of research. Uh, the Chestnut Ridge, for those people that don't know, is a 75-mile ridge uh, that uh, uh, begins in, in Morgantown, West Virginia, and it goes through uh, several of our counties up here in Pennsylvania. Uh, a lot of strange things happened there. And there was a gentleman that was taking a walk. And in this clearing, he saw two things that he described as brownies, which are these little house fairies from Harry Potter. And they were wrestling with each other. And he watched it for a while. And he couldn't remember if they had clothes on or not because their bodies so blended in with the world around them, this natural world. Uh, but anyways, as they were going about uh, gallivanting, one of them noticed the guy was watching them. Um, and then um, the thing disappeared into the side of the hill. And the guy was very clear that there was no hole there. There was no chasm. There was no way for that thing to uh, uh, exit in the side of the hill. It just kind of absorbed in the side of the hill. Now, the other one then went through an inventory of shape shifts which is exceedingly interesting in a, the field of cryptozoology until it became a very large bird and flew away. As my my cat comes up here, see? Yes. That's a good-looking cat there, Guru. Yeah, that is a good-looking cat. That's, That's good my looking. dad's cat, yeah. That's a handsome-looking cat. Yeah. All right, quickly here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jennifer says... I've got an urban goblin story. I saw it, Ron. Where can I contact you? I have a witness as well. we got 45 seconds. All right, so there's two ways to do this, and if you can write this up. You say you go to Ronald L. Murphy Jr., Ronald L. Murphy Jr. at yahoo.com. 
That's my direct link. Uh, or you can friend me or like me on Facebook, Ronald Murphy or Ronald L. Murphy Jr. is my author page. I cannot wait to talk to you about this stuff. Yeah, that'll be good. I want to hear that. We will. Next time in October, Dave, I will I will contact this person. We will talk, and we'll give you the rundown in October. Yeah, I, I'm going to need that. I'm going to need that. She says, I don't know if it was a goblin, but it sure looked like one. Hey, we'll, we'll figure this out, my dear. All right. Guru, we got you for another half an hour here on Spaced Out Radio. You're doing a great job. Ronald L. Murphy Jr., type that into Amazon. You can pick up any of his books. We love Guru time here on Spaced Out Radio. We got it for another 30 minutes. Then at the bottom of hour number three, we're going to be joined by Fedora John Stetson, Hudson, whatever you want to call him, for the unbiased UFO report. We'll be back with hour three of Spaced Out Radio next. All right, Guru, we're clear. All right. I'll let you yeah. chat with the audience. I'm going to take a bathroom break. All right. And that's one of my <clears throat> favorite times. I love chatting with the All audience. Right. You go. I'll be All back. All right. Let's see what we've got here. Let's see. Mm hmm. Yeah, that is a pretty cat. So uh, what happened was a couple days before uh, uh, Thanksgiving, my, my, my father unfortunately passed away uh, due to COVID-related pneumonia. Uh, and he had this gorgeous white cat. And I already had a cat, and, uh, but I had to take the cat because it's, it's just such a pretty uh, well-mannered cat. So um, I do want to talk. Yep, there you go. Ronald L. Murphy Jr., that's right. Um, I do want to talk puck wedgie sometime. Uh, that's one of the things that I uh, that I really have interest in too, uh, up there in the great uh, um, what is it the uh, the uh, Bridgewater Triangle up there in Massachusetts, um, yeah. So brownies could be from uh, the Sealy or the Unsealy quartz, absolutely. But the way I look at this uh, Zuni is that uh, all fairies are very ambiguous in their nature. And I think it's very difficult to categorize them either as light or dark. I think they could be both at any time. Let's see here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, have, uh, uh, let's see here. Have I seen any cryptids uh, lately? I have not. Um, actually, uh, I will tell you the honest to goodness truth. I have never seen a cryptid of any kind. I, I found anecdotal evidence. I found footprints. I've heard some vocalizations, uh, but it's enough to keep me going, but I've never actually seen a cryptid. Um, yes. So Aaron, yes. So, um, the, the, the native population, uh, uh, that I've encountered, uh, both in Canada and the United States, have been one of the most, they're some of the most beautiful people I've ever met. Um, and they're very open with their stories if you legitimately have um, interest in, in, in gathering knowledge from them. And I would definitely like to talk to that particular tribe. Uh, the three-foot-tall grasshopper beings have often been associated. Okay, so whenever UFOs became, and I'm not sure how old you are, Kiara. But whenever UFOs uh, were starting to be seen, um, we would have uh, reports, and we have to understand, the, the idea of, of abductions and actually seeing these uh, creatures uh, probably only go back as far as uh, Barney and Betty Hill, at least in our collective imaginations. And they describe them very much as greys. Uh, but there was other things going on in the 70s as well, too, other abductions, and people describe these these giant insect eyes. And I think that that's what we come across with this idea of these um, these uh, uh, grasshopper type of creatures. And uh, yes, the uh, Hockamock Swamp, uh, absolutely, up there in the Bridgewater Triangle. Uh, Native American language, I believe it's the Wampanoag, which is kind of like a warning to stay away from here.
let's see here. The Fuzzy Alligators of Pittsburgh. Magnus, no. I do know that there is an Algonquin legend of something called the uh, uh, Aquea or the Aguea or something like that. Uh, some sort of uh, uh, creature uh, that lives uh, in the uh, rivers of Pittsburgh, but not the Fuzzy Alligator. Um, a real quick thing about uh, um, alligators. Um, uh, people have surmised that by the time people came to Jamestown, which was 1607, that um, alligators may have had a habitat as far north as the Potomac River. So that's something to think about, too. Um, the Green Children is something we could do an entire show on the Green Children, uh, Black Dragon. So anytime, the, the, the Green Children of Woolpit, absolutely, dude, absolutely. Hey, uh, Drew. Lee, enough to know who he is, Brian. Yeah, enough to know who he is. Let's hear all right. Appreciate that, man. Oh, no worries. Guru time. This is why we love them, people. So, Alien Critter wants to know what the most scariest case I've ever researched. Uh, next month, uh, I will be back on, and I, I have things to tell you and things to tell Dave that have never been reported before. So, we will go into all that scary stuff next month there, Dave. Does that sound good? That sounds perfect for our Halloween guru special. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. We'll talk some pretty scary stuff. Yep. That that works for me. You got to tune in next time, Alien Critter. That's for sure. Um, after show? Yes, there will be an after show with, uh, with our good friend uh, Fedora. I'm not supposed to call him Stetson anymore because I know it's not a Stetson. It's a Fedora John. All right, so we'll get that to him. I want to say a big thank you to Black Dragon, Murray, Bat Mom, Swampy, Linda, GFGFGFG, Brian, Kira, uh, Kat from Paranormal Heart, and G West for the amazing super chats tonight. It's a great way to support what we do on this show. Thank you to all the veterans who have tuned on in. You always have a home here at Spaced Out Radio. And all our regulars who are here nightly, we absolutely love you. We couldn't do it without you. You guys make it so much fun. Here comes Hour 3. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Let's kick off the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Sangfroid. Sangfroid is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce the crypto guru, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. He is a fan favorite of ours, as he talks cryptids all night long and of course the guru's books can be found on amazon search ronald l murphy jr he's an award winner you will absolutely love his writing style guru welcome back hey thank you very much my friend i cannot believe that we're down to our last what are we we, we have like 23 minutes um and this just flew by are we so we, we talk about time not existing you know a lot of times I, i've said things like that time is not linear it's just a human construction and and times like this it, it really does show because this just flew by true but we should tell our audience that you will be on with us next month as well oh, where oh, you are going to tell some real creepy halloween type spooky stories yeah. And they're all they're all genuine. So these these will be stories that I usually don't share things about uh, my research. You know, I'll write about them and I'll put them into books. But a lot of things that I research come out very very personal. And there's one particular story that I have next month 
that hit a lot of nerves as a dad and everything. So I do want to bring that up. So I probably have at least a couple hours of stories that uh, that has happened in my own personal investigations that you guys will be the first ever to listen to. All right. We look forward to that next month for our Halloween special with the guru. Evan is asking, have we been able to figure out how long Sasquatch live? Yeah. Well, again, so these are all great questions. Um, but we have to assume that first of all, that, that Bigfoot is a flesh and blood animal. Um, so we can look at, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of, um, relatives, if you will, in the natural world. And you can say, you know, how long does a silverback gorilla live? You know, how long does a human being live? So I would think that, you know, a range that you would put on there is, you know, for a high range, anywhere from like 35 to 55 years old. Um, but the wild is a very dangerous place. And I would doubt that a creature like that would make it very long in the wild. But I mean, it's extremely possible as well, too. But, it, but from just from a biological point of view, it's very rare that these kind of creatures would reach um, a very ancient age in the wild. Wow. All right. Well, let's move on to TFV. Are gargoyle cryptids and anything interesting about them as of late? Have you had any new reports? No. You know, there was this uh, gargoyle wave of sightings in uh, my neck of the woods uh, a few years ago where people were seeing this creature that looked like it had these leathery wings. Um, It had this very odd shaped oval head that went back almost to a crest and it was very odd but people were seeing these in an area called shakura uh which is a few you know 20 or so miles outside of pittsburgh and uh, they called it the shakura gargoyle um i started to look at some uh some of the uh uh eyewitness reports and what it seemed to me is this um Again, I brought this up before at a conference, and a lot of people say that I was full of it. But what the, the this gargoyle seemed to look like is somebody that was wearing, if not a wingsuit, but somebody that might have been using some sort of paraglider. Um, the What they were saying was an elongated head looked very much in the drawings as somebody that was wearing a helmet that was um, built for aerodynamics. And the, the, these wings that they said it, it had looked almost like a cape as if it could have been um, uh, 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 one of these sailing suits that people wear. Now, those are very expensive. Uh, this area would not be a prime area for such things. But if somebody was going to orchestrate um, a hoax, uh, that would be the way to do it. So the jury is still out on there. But I think that I can find a lot of antecedents in the modern world that looks like this was, if not an outright hoax, somebody, you know, misinterpreted what they saw to be something that was very human in origin. All right. Have you ever heard of the fuzzy alligators in Pittsburgh? Magnus wants to know. No. And whenever you were on your hiatus there, I, t- I, I, I never heard about this before. Um, the Algonquin Indians around the, uh, the, the three rivers there in Pittsburgh, uh, reported that it was something called an agua, something along those lines. I think it was probably pronounced close to agua, um, but um, it, of course it would have been, you know, anglicized and everything. Um, but they reported that before the white settlers came into the area, there was a creature that that occupied these these rivers in Pittsburgh that would come up and snatch deer from the bank. Okay, while well, they fed. A couple things about this. Uh, Are these boogeyman stories that keep native children away from a very dangerous river? Possibly. Um, Could it be um, a very large fish? Uh, Well, the only thing that could bring a deer down off of an embankment would possibly be a bull shark. And we know that you can get to the Ohio River if you really try hard enough uh, by going up the Mississippi River. So a bull shark indeed could have done such a trip. And that could have been the origins of this. Um, But as I was saying to the viewers before you came on, um, at the founding of Jamestown in 1607, it has been speculated that the the American Alligators Range may have been as far north as the Potomac River in Virginia. Uh, That being said, 
if there would have been a period of, of drought seasons and very um, mild winters. Um, it's, it's, it's not probable, uh, but it is possible that an alligator could have come as far as Pittsburgh. All right, TFV is asking, have you ever looked into flying rods? I have. Um, so the, the show, and this was one of the greatest shows, I think, uh, that was ever on television, and that was called Monster Quest. Um, it did a great show on these flying rods, and what it showed is that these rods seem to be um, insects that whose flights matched up with the photography of the film or the photography of the camera that was being utilized. So it would appear as a very elongated um, tube with um, these kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, leathery wings that were flying through. I think that is indeed what has been going on in most cases. I received, and this is probably going back six years ago, I received a video uh, from somebody's game camera who lived, you know, about 20 miles from where I was. And he said, take a look at this. So there was what you would call a rod, one of the stereotypical type of rods, you know, that, that straight line. But it appeared as if it had a thorax. Now, this was in the wintertime, and you might be able to say it was a bug. Now, you could probably even say that it was a bug in the wintertime because strange things happen. I have found frogs and snakes uh, wandering around in the snow before. So it's not beyond the question that a stray bug is still out whenever there's snow on the ground. But what is interesting is whatever this rod was, it actually grabbed the game camera and moved it. Um, so that's the first time I've ever seen anything like that. That was the last time I've ever seen anything like that. But, um, of course the jury is still out. The search still goes on. All right. Follow up. What about the one over in the airport and in an urban setting? Um, a rod are we talking about? Or, yes. Okay. I, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that one particular. I, I, I don't, I don't know that one. Um, I've not seen any video evidence of that or anything, but uh, I will definitely look that up. All right. Uh, Zoon is asking, what's your thoughts on the beast of Javodin? Of uh, Javodin. So this is one of my favorite things to talk about, guys. Uh, this is like a show in and of itself. So this is during the French and Indian War. Um, so France already is pretty strapped uh, for money. Uh, they're fighting the First World War that has theaters in, in, you know, right. I actually live in an area where uh, much of the French and Indian War was fought. Um, Ten miles down the road, we have forts that are dedicated to this, you know. So this was a time whenever France was at war. And what happens is in the outskirts of the peasant communities, um, people start showing up dead. And I'm not talking about like one or two people. Uh, some people put the kill total up as high as 300 people. This is something very serious going on to the point that King Louis is having a bit of a problem with it. His, his people are, are, are scared. And even though he's at war, he still sends out an attachment of his royal, royal huntsmen to try to kill this. And they assume that it's a wolf. Although the people that report seeing this creature said it's about the size of a cow. Um, you know, it's a very large creature, something like they've never seen before. Um, but the killings go on. The huntsmen come out. They kill a particular animal. Uh, it's a very, very large wolf. They have it stuffed. They take it to King Louis. Um, but guess what? Uh, like the next day, like three children are killed at one time. Like it, it's just so bizarre. Um, and then they send a guy out by the name of Jean Chastel, who says he's going to be able to get this creature. And he uses nothing. He uses a silver bullet. The first time silver uh, is ever used against uh, one of these kind of creatures. And he kills it. A very, very large wolf that doesn't actually appear uh, to be a wolf. It's something strange, what have you. Um, but as you look deeper into the story, um, this is a time of um, the Enlightenment. And people wanted to show how intelligent they were by having menageries, which are like private zoos. And people would have peacocks, and sometimes they would have, you know, other strange things, bears and such. 
We know Jean Chastel had a menagerie. We also know that he had lions in that menagerie, and we also know that he had hyenas in that menagerie. One of my theories is, because he became quite rich after this, one of my theories is he simply opened the door to his menagerie, let a few of his animals out, um, and they preyed upon the people. Uh, there was enough hysteria going around wherever he then went out, became the hero, and collected a very large sum of money. That's, that, that is probably the most logical thing that happened, but some people also are claiming that it's a werewolf, which, you know, there's also speculation that maybe one of Jean Chastel's family members was a werewolf, and he knew how to get rid of it, and that's what happened to the Beast of Gévaudan. But that's a show in and of itself, one of my favorite stories. Very cool. <coughs> Very cool. All right, let's go to another question. Joe is asking, have you ever heard of the Van Meter monster? I have. That is what like is a, this one about? Yeah, okay, this is like, um, this is kind of like a Mothman. This is kind of like a Spring Hill Jack. This is kind of um, uh, Jack the Ripper all rolled into one. A very strange type of uh, uh, Victorian thing uh, that was seen. Um, uh, sparks flying from his, his, his heels. Um, he, he could fly. He could shoot fire and lightning from his, uh, from his, um, from his uh, hands and from his eyes. Just a really, really weird type of uh, incident that was going on. What kind of creature is it? We don't know. I, nobody knows. I mean, I, whenever you uh, whenever you look at it, you can't really say that this is a cryptid. Uh, you could say it is. Some people assume that it was an extraterrestrial uh, because it seemed to have so many kind of uh, um, uh, attributes that would you know electricity and stuff like that. Um, some people claim that it was a demon, and some people claim that it was just simply a, a figment of the imagination or a stunt pulled off by the newspaper. Weird. There's yeah. a lot of that that kind of goes around, though, isn't there? There is, yeah. So before television, um, you know, people had to sell newspapers, uh, and they would sometimes come up with very outlandish stories. In my opinion, most of the stories are not outlandish, okay? I think every now and then you would have some journalist that would go out there and make up a story to sell papers. But I think a lot of these these newspapers were truly reporting on instances that were being told to them. So it's very hard because you could say all these newspaper stories that talk about giants. Well, that was just trying to sell newspapers. Not in those cases, I don't think. Things like the Van Meter monster, probably. Giants, absolutely not. Because you would find them, you know, in the late 1800s up into the early 1900s, whenever people were reporting getting, you know, finding giants on the property. And one of the interesting things about this is whenever these giants were uncovered, it usually named a name. You know, it had a source to it. It wasn't anything that was anonymous. So I think that uh, whenever we look at uh, newspapers, it cannot always be ruled out as some sort of um, um, a trick to sell newspapers. I think there is serious journalism going on there, too. Guru, we got you for another seven minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. Crypto guru Ronald Murphy talking weird creatures all night long. Ron, I, I know I've asked you this in the past, but I love asking you this question because our audience is always changing. Mm -hmm. We know about Bigfoot. We know about Dogman, goblins, gargoyles, mermaids, sea monsters. What is your favorite lesser-known cryptid that needs more research and, and needs to get out the public a little bit more? Wow, that is a good one, man. Um, well, there's this one called a water hound uh, in Ireland. Um, I, I, I cannot begin to, uh, to give you the, uh, Irish tra translation of that name. Um, but it seems to represent a very large otter. I mean, at least that's how it's portrayed, uh, to the point that somebody back in the 1800s was actually killed by one of these creatures and somebody, uh, drew a picture on the tombstone. Um, people report seeing this creature to this day. Um, and we do know that otters are capable of getting very, very large. And we also know, it's kind of like that Australia effect, we know that they're not all cute and cuddly little animals. They're predatory creatures. Um, but this creature was big enough to occasionally um, chase down people and prey upon people. 
Uh, so the, the, the water hound or the water dog of Ireland is really one of my uh, favorite ones. Uh, the gray man of the Highlands of Scotland, uh, Ben McDewey, uh, is one of my favorites as well, too. Um, sometimes it appears as a Bigfoot creature. Sometimes it appears as a gray mist. That's another one that is extremely uh, uh, close to uh, my heart as well. Um, and, um, you know, I think you just have little regional things like the puck wedgie up in Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the Albert Witch here in Pennsylvania, which is kind of like a, a little mini version of Bigfoot. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's really too many to mention. I would love to be out in the field looking for any of them. You know which one really hits for me is over in Iceland with with wow. all with all of the little people. Yeah, that's where, right. Where literally, if they assume there is little people in an area, they will divert roads. They that's will right. divert construction yeah. in order yeah. to protect these creatures. Yep, yeah. it happens all the time. As a matter of fact, if they're building a road and they come across even a boulder. You know, something that reminds them or something that um, elicits some sort of feeling that this belongs to these little creatures, they will, as you said, divert entire highway systems around these things. So you'll have a tree standing out in the middle of nowhere and the highway going by because they believed it was the home of a, uh, of, a, of, a of an elf, a fairy creature, what have you. Gnome Squatch says night crawlers are quite underrated. Yeah, night crawlers are a little underrated, but there's very little known about them as well, too. Uh, besides those couple of videos, there's really nothing else has been 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 done by, about them. Uh, I would love to see more more evidence about them, but uh, as of now, people are saying that it's you know it's a hoax because we don't have anything else. For Behoff, Duende. What's the oh, du- what's the Duende? Okay, that's kind of like the South American version of um, of a gnome. Uh, but the cool thing about duende, though, uh, that's actually a, a Celtic word, and that refers to um, a group of fairies, a group of um, uh, the ancestral race, I guess you could say. It's the uh, the genesis for these kind of supernatural creatures. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Why do yeah. you think we don't focus on the little cryptids very much? Like like the little people First Nations talk about, mm-hmm. like the gnomes, like the the leprechauns in Ireland, where there's literally forests that are that have areas that you could not enter because they believe leprechauns live there. I sure. mean, there's a lot of this folklore of little people as we got three minutes left. Yeah. Well, I will answer the way uh, J.R.R. Tolkien described it. He said that the uh, Victorians ruined our perception of little people. Uh, they so uh, infanticided, you know, they are so uh, they made them into uh, things of, of children. They, they made them into, uh, you know, fairy tales that they lost their luster and they lost any kind of... Uh, of uh, reality in our world. Uh, so I blame the, those gosh darn Victorians that made them into something that they weren't and that uh, we kind of push them away from us now and we won't believe in them anymore because they're the stuff of, you know, fairy tales. Do they need more research? Oh, absolutely. That's, that's, that's my big thing. Like if you would say, Ron, what do you believe in? Is there a Bigfoot? Is there this? Is there that? I would say that these could all be explained as manifestations of the elemental intelligences that we need to study even more. Wow. B hop yeah. says, I only know about the Duende by researching goblins. Pretty sure I encountered one as a child. Wow. I wonder where that was located. I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. Guru, we got about n- just over 90 seconds left with you tonight, and it is always a pleasure to have you here on Spaced Out Radio. You are like family around here, I and that. I look forward to you coming back on the show in October where we're going to get into a lot of spooky stories that you've never told on any other show before. That's exactly right. And um, I guess you have the capability. How about like in the next month, I start sending over some pictures as well, too, so we can share some pictures of some of the uh, things I've encountered as well. Well, our radio audience will have to check out the archives for that. Then. Okay. Okay. Tell our listeners where they can find you, your information, and all your books. Okay, so you go to Amazon. That's where everything is done anymore on Amazon. You can theoretically go to your local bookstore and order my books there as well, too. Uh, but they're going to charge you, you know, shipping and handling. So I would just do the uh, the 
the uh, the Amazon thing. It's going to be a lot cheaper for you. Uh, or you could contact me directly, and I would have no problem sending you out a book for probably far cheaper than it would cost for you to buy it uh, on Amazon. Uh, you can get in touch with me with Ronald L. Murphy Jr. at yahoo.com. That is my direct email address. I would love to talk to you. Um, Find me on Facebook, Ronald Murphy, or and uh, like my uh, my author page, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. Uh, and uh, I will be doing really no big conferences this year because of the whole COVID thing. Uh, but hopefully, 2022 will uh, be a whole new world, and we'll be able to get out there, and I'll be able to actually meet people in person. Guru, thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio once again. You were like family. It's been about six years since we've been doing this, man. And mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate you, brother. Man, I appreciate you too. Dave, I love you as a brother. That's that's true. And uh, the reason I like coming on this show is because every single one of these individuals really have a desire to get to the bottom of, of these questions in life. And I'm glad I'm here for it. Yeah. All right. Coming up next, we have John Hudson in the Unbiased UFO Report. And so much more on Spaced Out Radio next. Thank Good you, job, I Guru. Appreciate I appreciate it. I really do. And all these people over here, I hope that I do hear from you guys. Um, I would love to talk. Even if you do not agree with my point of view, I like to listen to other people's uh, opposing points of view because that can only, uh, uh, you know, enliven me and educate me more. Uh, so, yeah, I would love to be able to talk to these guys more. But seriously, next month, put it on the uh, on the calendar. It's going to be an awesome show. Yeah, next month you will be with us on the 15th, October 15th. Sounds excellent. All right. Sounds excellent. All right, buddy. I got to run Sounds here. I got to get ready for the UFO report. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I love yeah. you, brother, and thank you for saving the beard for this show, okay? Yeah. That's right. That's right. We'll see you next time, brother. We got to get a robe for you, a special robe and staff. Oh, you cut out too quick. I think the guru needs a robe and staff. That's what I think. I think that would look awesome. I think that would look completely awesome for the guru. Mm Mm-hmm. I believe it. I totally believe it. Hey, Chad Smith, what's happening? I am Chad Smith. I am Chad Smith. I'm Chad Smith. I'm Chad Smith. No middle name, just I'm Chad Smith. Chad Smith. I am Chad Smith. Who the hell are you? You're a Chad one, Mr. Smith. Mm. Be humble, be helpful. That's what Chad Smith always told me as a kid. Good advice there, Behoff. Chad Smith is the Chad Smith. Magnus, Chad, I am Chad Smith. Smith, very nice. Sandra needs more Chad in her life. Witchy says, Chad Smith, you are a nice one. That's awesome. (laughs) That is awesome. Oh, Justin's apparently Chad Smith. All right, here comes Fedora John, a.k.a. Chad Smith. How you doing, sir? Good, buddy. How are you? You hear me okay? Yep, yep. can hear you fine. Wonderful. Wonderful. I got another friggin' moth in here. I got two of them in here now. Your 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 selection of, of the things that you like and don't like, the things that, that you're afraid of and not afraid of, completely violate all laws of logic. Mm. Don't blame me. Blame Chad Smith. There you go. 
Mm-hmm. That one's on my Texas flag. That one's up on the roof. Mm-hmm. Oh, you there? I am. Yeah, sorry. I had a small network problem for a second. Had to fix. Oh, that's okay. Hey, Logan. How you doing, buddy? How's your throat doing? Not bad. Good. Not bad. I'm not afraid of the moths. I just can't stand moths. They're annoying. I gotta get rid of this guy. This guy's pissing me off here. Hold on. I'm not even gonna kill this guy. Oh, he got away. He got away. Oh, see, now he went behind the wall and... Oh, son of a gun. He saw me coming. I, I moved too quick. I moved way too quick. I needed more stealth there, and I didn't do it. All right, big thank you to Spooky, G West, Cat, Kira, Brian, GF, 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 G, Linda, Swampy, Batma, Murray, and Black Dragon for the awesome super chats. <clears throat> hey, Smoky Mountain Wanderer, how are you? And the fellow Chad Smithians, thank you to all the veterans. Tuning on in, because we absolutely love it here. You always have a safe home here with us. Thank you to all of our regulars who are tuning in. Don't forget the after show with John happens right after this. Here we go, everyone. Rounded third, we're heading for home tonight on Space Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with the unbiased UFO report. Fedora John Hudson is back. And you know we love it when he's here breaking down the latest... UFO News. John, it is always a pleasure to have you here, my friend. And you know what? I'm going to grind my teeth through this first one. That's for sure. (laughs) I am going to grind my teeth. Tom DeLong getting vindication through an Esquire magazine article? Come on. You you know, I almost didn't even bother putting any other items in in my list for I figured this won't be <laughs> one article will take all of our time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, first off, I, I, you know, I think that the person who wrote this has been listening to your show, and I think, I think they wrote this just for you. Um, uh, one hell of a title. Um, you know, the way it was written, it almost seems like um, this might have somehow been tied into that video interview we saw recently with him on the beach. If it's not the same interview, then he was doing multiple interviews the same day because the writer describes the same scene that we saw in the video interview of him. Um, but, you know, I, I got to say, I was, I was kind of blown away by the article. It was actually a, a kind of an interesting article. And um, the, the writer of it um, really uh, put a lot of effort into rationalizing and grasping the concepts that that tom was talking about and i mean you know as well as i do how tom talks right i mean he 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 takes some of the the deeper uh concepts that you and i you know deal with in our research and and just kind of you know just dumps them out into conversation and you know just blah 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 and it catches people off guard and she and she really tried to um uh, she really tried to internalize it and um and they talked about they talked about spoon bending 
They talked about Bigfoot. They talked about, um, you know, UFOs. They talked about, um, you know, he, he explained his hypothesis that essentially um, that, that time is, is, is unified and that, you know, that uh, all timelines happen at the same time and that UFOs are just uh, others from other timelines that are able to slip through to our timeline and that they're more like submarines displacing space time than, than ships. And I mean, he, he covers the gambit. Um, it was actually, it was a, it, for, for an interview that wasn't very long, it, it, he covered the gambit of, of topics and the writer um, really tried to grasp what he was talking about. And uh, I, I don't know if they succeeded or not, but what I was kind of surprised that I came away with was this realization that if, if someone who's totally foreign to these concepts is, is presented these concepts in, a, in, an, in, an, in an environment where they have an open mind, um, I guess what I'm coming to is it, it, it left me with, a, with a, a lot more hope than I thought it would that essentially a lot of the more difficult concepts that, that folks like you and I study are, are going to be actually considered and, and, and people are going to actually try to understand them that, that don't do this kind of research. Okay, I'll give you that. And, and you know, Esquire magazine's a pretty big magazine to do a, to do a, an article on. I, I get that. Yeah. And I can appreciate the the run on that and the fact that he did the article good for him do you think that with his recent podcast that he did with jim semivan and he's done now two interviews do you think that he's trying to rebuild his name in ufology right now oh absolutely oh absolutely and you know and personally um you know uh i would advise him to do that exact thing now, on that same personal note, I would suggest he he did a little bit longer, um, give a little more, you know, give a little more breathing room between you know uh, past events and now. But I think I think he feels a fair amount of pressure to do this because of of what he thinks is coming next. And and then the flip side of it too is that he still is the CEO of a media company that is producing movies and and books. Books that a lot of the people in this community actually really enjoy. And so there is still a business there to support. And, you know, he needs to have a, a uh, at least somewhat of a, of, a, of a reputation in this field to be able to be CEO of a company like that. Well, outside, so I think he outside, has of, outside of UFO Twitter, he has no reputation. He blew that reputation. Well, that's what I thought. But he just got this beautiful article on uh, esquire yeah but any, i mean anybody could write a fluff piece though i know i know but i guess i guess what i found myself thinking about dave and and it kind of made me giggle a little bit to be really honest with you because of the conversations you and i've had but it's it's the realization that um the average person is not going to take the kind of discerning eye to tom DeLong that a lot of people in this community would or or have and um, and so they're going to look at a lot of of little pieces of information that are in the mainstream media and stitch those together to form an opinion of him. And uh, my personal guess at this point is that he pulls it off. My personal guess at this point is that he he does get vindicated. And at least in the mainstream media, he becomes a bit of a of a darling when it comes to this topic. Well, we'll see how much media attention he could get because, I mean, his sister, Carrie DeLong, is his press person. and she... Well, he could just take his clothes off. and You know, I mean, it's worked before. Well, yeah, <laughs> so he says. You know, look, I don't have anything against Tom DeLong, the, the gentleman. I don't know the man. I will fully admit I like Blink-182. I wish he would go back there. Okay? I really do. Okay, the album, Take Off Your Clothes and Jacket, was was fantastic it really was but he has just to me i'm gonna put it this way tom delong to me is everything that is wrong with ufology and i know that's a strong statement to make but from not going from alienating 
the UFO people who've been doing this for decades, the experiencers who've been experiencing for decades. He had an opportunity. I was told by an insider this, very close to this situation. They knew, starting the TTSA, that they had an opportunity to really bring ufology together and really make a major, major statement with all of us behind them. They had more people than every... NFL stadium filled behind them. And the first thing that they did was they cut out ufology. They cut out all the researchers. They cut out everybody who had experiences. They cut out their biggest supporters. And that was one of the black eyes that killed the TTSA and sees it in the remnants we see it today. And that's all because of DeLong. It's not because of Semivan. It's not because of Robert Bigelow. It's not because of Lou Elizondo or Chris Mellon or Steve Justice or Hal Putoff or anybody else involved. Gary Nolan for his short time when he was there. Okay, This is all on DeLong. And for the fact that he's now going to try and rebuild himself, hey, I'm all about second chances, but are you going to do it right this time or are you going to play rock star again in the UFO field? Well, it, look, look, Dave. I think what it comes down to is, is I think that one. I think I think all your criticisms of 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 the way he handled this are are all very valid in in almost everyone's eyes. I think that your emotional reaction to that stuff is is completely valid and normal because this is a this is a a, a research field that that you obviously care a little more than a little about, right? I mean, you put a lot of your personal life into this, into this field, right? And he basically, you know, flittered on odor over and danced all over the, the, the semi. I mean, it's like, I mean, he, he, like everything you said, he did to something that a lot of uh, people really care about and, and should care about. And so it's hard not to take offense to that. And I totally, I totally get that. Um, but I, I, for me, um, you know, while I liked Blink-82, I wasn't a big fan. For me, it's that, um, with me, to be very honest, it's me. Tom and I are, are close to the same age. We both grew up in California around the same time. We had a lot of the same influences. To me, he's just another UFO nut that loves the topic and got a, a little over his skis. And there's and nothing so wrong with that. And so if he that. wants to slide back into that researcher role, I'm all for that. I'm all for that, too. Okay, but he he's been put on a pedestal since day one. Okay, yeah. when he was named by the International UFO Congress as researcher of the year before his book came out and before the Two the Stars Academy even was formed. All right, because organizers, certain organizers for that event were already kissing his butt. All yeah. right, it was, so kind, you, it was kind of like when they gave Obama the um, uh, what was it the was it Nobel no was it. The Nobel Peace Prize, I think it was. Too political. They gave it to him like, a, Too like his, fir- his first year. No, but I'm saying it was a similar idea that, that he got someone got an award for what they were going to do versus what they had already done. Absolutely. And, and because of the amount of excitement, right? And and then it hurt them because they got it too early, right? So right. that's the comparison okay, I'm drawing. I, I yeah. see where you're going um, with that. You know, yeah, I mean, it, it was, um, you know, it, it um, no, I mean, I totally forgot about that. And, um, you know, Oh yeah. I mean, that was a, that was a, that was a, it, it, yeah. I mean, look, I guarantee you in hindsight, well, I would hope in hindsight, he would play this out completely differently. I don't see um, it. And I, I, uh, and maybe you're right. And maybe that's just who Tom is, but I agree with what you said earlier. And it, and it bothers me personally that I think there was an opportunity. I think there was a really, a really nice, there's always going to be division. There's always going to be Pepsi versus Coke, but I think there was a real opportunity to, to create a unifying um, a group within this community and they didn't just not pull it off. They, they went in the complete opposite direction yeah. and in many ways made it worse. And you know, I wish I could give up my source on that. I really, really wish I could give up my source because my source is very close to this situation and has filled me in on a lot of the back story of what happened there. And I, well, honestly, just... I don't think you. I don't think you need to give away your source. I don't think what you. I don't think. I don't think what your source told you is is it in any way, shape, or form unbelievable. I, no. I think it's something most people would just accept as true because it sounds. It sounds completely logical. No, I. I understand that, my man. I understand that. My thing is now. I'm grinding my gears because 
I was happy that Tom DeLong had gone away. <laughs> okay. I really was because I was sick of the game. I was sick of the what if I told you? I was sick yeah, of that, that I, was, I was, that was sick hard. of the posts that he would post some fake UFO video and two hours later would yank it down, which by the way, insiders tell me this was a big, big no no for that group. And he they asked him a number of times to stop and finally they started threatening him that if you continue this, we are going to resign. That is insider info right there. Okay. And Tom- I, I, I heard it went as far as, as, as people developing a little bit of PTSD that when their phones would go off, they were scared that, oh, oh no, oh no, what's, what's, yes. what's Tom done what's, now? What's Tom done now? <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. I even put this in my 14 reasons. Okay. There's a time to rock star and there's a time not yeah. to rock star. Yeah. And totally throughout good. his TTSA career, it's uh, he's always chosen time not to rock star to rock star, if that makes any sense. He he's consistent. I'll give him that. Yes, very very consistent, and mm-hmm. I just I hope he comes in with a different attitude. I don't expect it. I expect it to be much the same. Where it's screw you, ufology. I'll do what I want, and look what I got, and look at me, and follow me once again. And well, his his. Go ahead. So go ahead. I was going to say his his theory of everything interview he did with Jim Simivan sitting there with him. Um, he he was he if he'd been if he'd behaved like that from the beginning, it would have been a whole different ball game. He mm. was it, Semivan was clearly had 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 a huge influence on him. Well, I mean that is a that is a good mentor to have, and and one of the big questions is in the UFO world why is Semivan uh, stepped with him. And stuck with him. And I do know that Semi Van has listened to our show to check out what we've said about this whole situation. He has. He's probably hoping Tom will teach him those three chords he knows. God, I need to learn those three chords again. <laughs> I almost got two of them. I got two of them. I need that third one. I forget it again. All right. We got time for one more story here, my friend. And yes, the Demi Lovato trailer is released. Let's stick with the celebs. Yes, yes, yes. And um, you know, I mean, um, it's I don't I don't think it's bad. I mean, it's it's I mean, everyone should check it out. I'll post a link later. Um, you know, uh, you know, the hard thing for me is I don't have a terribly strong opinion of uh, or or a, a terribly happy view of pretty much all the other paranormal content out there and so she doesn't have a huge bar to hit you know and with that in mind i think it's kind of interesting you know i I mean, i'll check it out you know at least one episode I, I encourage everyone to check it out she's she's definitely taking it seriously hey i'll be the bad guy here again times two all right boy you're you're coming off looking like roses tonight <laughs> all right i think and, and I haven't seen the trailer yet, but I've, I've seen some photo shoots, I've seen some interviews, and I've talked to people who have worked with this show. And this is one thing I'll say. They say it's something different. It's something new. I think Demi Lovato is going to bring in an entirely young core of people who will now have interest. That's the pluses. What I would have liked to have seen is I would love to have seen her not investigating on her own because now it looks more like Rob Lowe and his son's running around America looking for Bigfoot ghosts and and aliens. I would like to have seen her and her two friends have somebody in the UFO field, a real veteran, doesn't matter who it is, a real trusted veteran, go along. Robin Obi-Wan Kenobi. Absolutely. Just one Obi-Wan Kenobi. Exactly. Going with you on your adventure. Yep. Absolutely. I agree. And I think that would change the entire dynamic of the yeah. show. But unfortunately for her in the UFO world, she is going to be laughed at. The TV companies, they don't care because what they look at is 55 million people following her on Twitter and another 55 plus million following her on Instagram. And that is their audience. That whole upcoming Disney uh, uh, kids who grew up with her are all watching it. They're following her music. My daughter is one of them. I know. And I agree with everything you said. Now, the one danger to all of us, the one danger that we all have to consider is that she got initiated by Greer. 
Yes. And so uh, all this press that she's creating could bring Greer a lot of influence. And while she may end up being a welcomed member of our community, we all know the challenges we have with Greer. I hope she follows through. And this isn't just a one hit wonder like most of her music. All right, John, we'll talk to you next week. Thank you so much. Well, no, I'll be around in a couple minutes, yeah? Yeah, for the round table. Yeah. yeah yep, Ra- yep, radio okay. side, though. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, yep, yep. All right, here we go. Thank you, sir. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show. Let's see what Shirky Poo has for us tonight. If there's a dentist out there willing to treat an apex predator underwater, we've got a gig for you. A recent cage diving expedition around Mexico's Guadalupe Island revealed a great white shark with a mouth that didn't have many teeth in it. No, th- you know what? I think this great white's been playing hockey up here in Canada, literally missing almost all its front teeth. Yeah, I bet you this thing is fought. You know, there's not really many tough guys in the NHL anymore, so I think it fought Ryan Reeves. Yeah, I think so. Because this thing looks like... No, we're not talking jaws here. We're talking gums. Pretty unusual for a shark to have that many missing teeth. Martin Graff, owner of Shark Diver, has said, Another... Anyone know a dentist? He goes and posts on his Instagram account after taking the photo of the missing tooth shark. It's definitely a Canadian shark. Canadian great white. Had to be born up here. Yeah, but hmm, doesn't need any crest uh, toothpaste, that's for sure. Moving on. Near the end of August, residents of Mississauga, Ontario, where we broadcast on Saga 960 AM, spotted a UFO flying through the sky. It was clearly documented, undeniable evidence that aliens were in the center of the universe. However... There's a plot twist here. It was not a UFO. No, it was an enlarged, helium-induced Mr. Peanut that was floating across the sky. Yes, you know, know, I'm even looking at this. You can totally tell it's Mr. Peanut. Come on, Mississauga. We're better than this. This is why I am so glad Jody and the crew have actually picked up our show the last almost two years now. Almost two years we've been broadcasting on Saga 960. Because now I can tell you the difference between a Mr. Peanut hot air balloon and a UFO. Thank goodness for Spaced Out Radio on Saga 960. I know Jody's going to laugh at that when she gets this show. I know she's going to hear this because she listens all the time. Jody, we're winning now. We are winning on Saga 960. Because we are telling the audience that Mr. Peanut Balloons are not UFOs. Speaking of UFOs, debris from several UFO cases dating back to 1947 are now being studied by Dr. Gary Nolan at Stanford University's Nolan Lab. In a recent interview with KQED, Nolan has discussed how he got involved in UFO studies and is loving his new research. Nolan says that working on UFOs, metamaterials, nothing like it. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rocking her in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thanks to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. On YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter, hanging out at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends... make a mistake. We're watching. We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, 
the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them too. Good night.